I guess I'll do a, a quick, uh, a, a brief introduction. Thank you all for coming to the San Jose Valley Water District Board of Directors meeting. Uh, we're going to start the meeting. We're not adjourning. We're not convening uh, the meeting until we have a special order of the day uh, for the oath of office for the new directors elect. Uh, the district secretary will administer the oath of office to the new board members. Well, please stand and raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Lois Henry, do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly I do solemnly swear or affirm, or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. And, and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith, faith and, allegiance and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. But to take, take this obligation freely, without any mental reservations, without any mental reservations, without any mental reservations or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, and I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which, discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'll ask the district council to move ahead uh, on the election of officers. Um, the first step, as I'm sure you're aware, um, in moving forward with today's meeting is to elect a president who will also presumptively serve as the chairperson for the board going forward. Of course, you do not presently have a chairperson, and so I would ask that among yourselves, you select someone to serve as an interim chairperson solely for the purpose of identifying a president slash chairperson who will conduct the rest of the meeting. And of course, the appointment of the president will require a majority vote of the board. So why don't we have Lois do that? Margaret could do it. You want to be interim? I would be happy to serve in that role. Okay. Is calling. You're calling for a nomination. Director Bruce, at some point before the uh, session is complete, there should be an opportunity for public comment. Thank you. Um, would you suggest that public comment occur before board discussion, or board discussion comes first? Uh, it, it, it's up to you, but um, it might be uh, more orderly to have public comment first before the agenda board discussion. Great. So be it. I would entertain public comment on the matter of the appointment of a board president or chair. Anyone who would like to speak on this matter, please identify yourself and limit your comments to brief remarks. And if you wouldn't mind, please come to the podium so that we can record it and hear what you have to say more clearly. Thank you, my name is Chris Finney, I'm from Boulder Creek, and um, I actually would recommend that you um, elect Margaret Bruce as board chair, uh, as she is the longest, uh, has the longest tenure on the board. Thank you. Hi, Lydia Hannon from Long Pico. I also would like to put in a word and have Margaret Bruce be the chair since she has been on the board the longest. It's her turn on the fire. <laughs> Thank you. You know? If anyone else would like to comment, please come to the podium and speak briefly. I'm Bruce Holloway from Long 
Um, Margaret Bruce is the only board president who served two terms in a row. And um, I have uh, many, many reasons why I, um, I hope that uh, ex-president Bruce's tenure will be brief on this board. So I would like to speak against the proposal by Ms. Finney. Hi, Deborah Lowe and Lafico. Um, this election had the highest turnout in the SLV history, I believe. And in the county, the most number of eligible people who could vote did register to vote. So I think this was a real mandate. So I would like to see one of the three new candidates take the helm because there's a lot of work to be done. And they ran on a very serious platform, and the people really respond to it. And I think it should be headed by one of them. Is there anyone else who would like to comment at this moment? All right. Thank you all for your comments this evening. Now I would entertain the conversation amongst the board. Do we need a motion? Yes, we do. I would like to nominate uh, the Lois Henry be board president, and I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Just to clarify, are you just taking nominations at this point, or are you actually moving for a vote on a particular candidate? We have a nomination and a second for Lois Henry, and I would encourage other board discussion if there's anyone else. And is there any way we can? I'm sorry for the interruption. The feedback is going to bother me. Could you please speak a little louder? Thank you. I will. Thank you for letting me know. All of you. Okay. Thank you. We don't have microphones this evening. Sometimes we do, so we'll remind people to speak up. And thank you for asking. Thank you. So we have a nomination and a second, and um, at this point, I think there's any board conversation about this. We've heard, from my perspective, we've heard two members of the public in favor, and two in favor of one of your candid the, the candidates from the, the recent election. Um, Mr. Smallman. Okay. We've heard your second, we've heard your nomination. Lois, your name is in the hat. Do you have any comment? Be happy to do it. I've got experience. Okay. I would be welcome. I, I would welcome a vote at this time. Would you be ready to take a roll call vote on the motion and the nomination for Lois Henry for board chair? Yes, okay. Um, Director Small. Aye. Director Bruce. Aye. Director Henry. Aye. Director Swan? Aye. Director Pauls? Yes. The motion passes. Pursuant to the board manual, the president is the presumptive chair when present, so I think it would be appropriate to deliver the gavel to uh, Dr. Henry as the new president. Thank you with either hand. <laughs> President uh, Henry, there's one additional item that's uh, issue that's part of this special order of the day, which is to elect a vice president for the board as well. To serve in your absence. Well, I'd like to nominate Bob Fultz. I would second that. Any other nominations? Hearing none, you want to call for the vote? Holly? Oh, is there any public comment? Sorry. Okay. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Bruce? No. President Henry? Aye. Director Swan? Aye. And Director Pulse? Yes. So, 
I go ahead and keep so going. Now Are there any additions? Move ahead and the secretary is ready to co convene the regular or the special board of directors meeting in the center of the Valley Water District. Or do you want to clarify? I that? do want to clarify that um, it is a regular meeting that was rescheduled to this date, uh, despite the fact that the agenda says special meeting. This is a regular meeting pursuant to board action. To that effect. So, Chair, you can call the meeting to order. I'll call the meeting to order. Are there any additions or or should we have roll call first? Yes, that's appropriate. Roll call. <laughs> Director Smallman. Here. Director Bruce. Here. President Henry. Here. Director Swan. Here. Director Pulse. Here. Okay. Now, are there any additions or deletions to the open session agenda? Staff has none. Hearing none. Um, we'll have oral communications. You may speak on any subject that's not on the agenda. Uh, you have three minutes. Hi. Mr. Holloway. So I know um, there's another item on the agenda about uh, committee appointments. I just want to make. We can't hear you. <laughs> There is at least one other item on the agenda about committee appointments. Um, and I just wanted to make some observations about committees because I've observed this board's committees for many years. Um, one thing I want to warn you about is that when you institute a committee, you institute a bevy of Brown Act complications. Okay, so typically you have several committees, but I'll just pick first one, finance, just pick one. You put two people on the finance committee, two board members, they can't talk to each other about finance anymore. They can't call each other on the phone or anything. They can never talk about anything in the sub of that subject matter outside of a committee meeting, a notice committee meeting that's public. That's a little bit of a complication. Furthermore, none of the other board members can talk to those two about anything to do with finance because that would be a serial meeting and that would be a majority of the board that can't do that either. Um, that's one of the problems. One of the other problems I've seen over the years is that committees begin to think, oh, well, we're in charge of, of this uh, thing, finance or engineering, environment or something. They think, oh, we're in charge now, but you're not. Committees are only advisory. They advise the board, so the board's always in charge. But staff gets confused too. I've been to many committee meetings where staff thinks they're getting direction from the committee. Um, um, even, if, even if all the committee says is, um, oh, let's come back next month with uh, get some more information and, and bring it back next month, they're taking up staff time and they're directing staff. So I'm going to warn you about committees. There's nothing that says you have to have committees at all. And um, maybe, I mean, if I were on board, I don't think I'd want other people talking about finance, other people talking about the environment. I mean, I, what, what am I? Chocolate? No, I would think I would be participating in all of those discussions. So I don't know if committees are your friend. Bill is voting. The last board got rid of Bill is voting. They thought Terry Vieira got a $125,000 judgment against him because he voted for a bill list one time. Well, I can straighten you out. He, he was in trouble because he had a conflict of interest. He had a financial interest in the district contract. That's where his problem arose. Voting on the bill list was just sort of a detail. I think you, you need to get back to voting for bill lists. Um, that's just cowardly. The last board utterly cowardly to stop voting for bill lists. And the last thing I want to say is um, the when, last time the board met in this room. Go ahead and finish your statement. Okay. Thank you. Last time the board met in this room, three months ago, the, the old board approved a conflict of interest code. Conflict of interest codes do not go into effect until they've been approved by the board of supervisors. And I have not seen that on the board of supervisors agenda. It's been almost three months. So what's the status? of the district's conflict of interest code. You didn't do a biennial review two years ago. You did one this year, but did it ever get submitted to the Board of Supervisors? And um, 
Specifically, I'm interested in section 87200, which um, I think applies to board members. I think it was proven in court that it applies to board members. I think the conflict of interest code should reflect that 87200 applies to board members. And if we don't get this ironed out, um, well, I think we better. Hi, Lydia Hammer from Pico. I'm more than happy to let him have a minute of my time. I only need two. Um, on your committees, since you brought it up, on your committees, I would really hope that the two board members that you put on the committees don't normally speak with each other on a regular basis, especially if they live in the same neighborhood. Uh, that way, there would be no appearance of a conflict of interest on those committees. And I do think you need to keep committees with a citizen member to have citizen participation in the process that happens with this water board. It's completely transparent that way. That's all I have to say. Thirty seconds. I'm Chris Finney from Boulder Creek again, and um, I actually wanted to address a couple of items. Um, one is that um, the new slate has uh, committed to uh, fiscal responsibility and transparency, and I have a couple of suggestions on those. Um, one is that the agenda be published earlier. 210 pages is a lot to read, even if you read as quickly as I do, and, um, and even more to actually research and absorb and stuff like that. So having the agenda out earlier um, would certainly make it a lot easier for citizens who wanted to participate or who wanted to comment to know what was going on. Um, secondly, um, in terms of transparency, it seems a poor idea to me to actually make a proposal like to change the, the procedure manual and to vote on it six days later. It seems like that's a very compressed timetable and it doesn't really give people a lot of time to print it out, read it, comment on it, stuff like that. Um, so more time for that, I think, would be a very good idea. Maybe to introduce it tonight and then vote on it next meeting. Um, the second one is about um, financial, uh, fiscal responsibility, shall we say. Um, doubling meetings doubles the cost. So having two meetings a month doubles the cost of meetings which is fairly substantial according to the figures that were in the agenda. Um, an additional $3,000 a month is nothing to sneeze at. Um, hiring a consultant could be pricey as well. And I think that most of the people, uh, most of the ratepayers in the Valley would rather see district money going to infrastructure upgrades. Thank you. I'm sorry. There is concern about um, where everything is. Um, you have an inventory in the computer, and the question brought up is can there be like GPS for where the pipes are and the pumps and you know, everything in the system? And you mentioned that there is a, a program that's very expensive. Now I have my brother send me an email and said, I'm here. So I think there's technology out there where you can use what's already free on the internet. If it has GPS locations, say I'm at the pump and send a text back to the office and get the locations. So we would have it, you might have to manually enter them, but at least you would have an actual GPS location. I mean, I don't know if it would work, but here, if it's free, worth a shot. wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, congratulate the people, uh, the new members of the board. Uh, also, um, uh, a question that has come up repeatedly uh, that I'd like the board to look into is uh, if it's, uh, if it makes sense to have an attorney from Los Angeles for this uh, water district. Thank you. Um, first, I want to just uh, say that I'm, I'm uh, 
congratulate the three new board members, and I hope that we can um, move forward in a positive way. Um, and I want to just speak to what I think is one of the most, if not the most important, issue that this board is going to face over the next <coughs> several years, which has to do with uh, climate change and uh, protecting our environment in light of the changes that we're going to be facing. Uh, uh, the changing, uh, going from droughts to, to, to uh, very wet winters, protecting the aquifers, um, and educating people. The Water Board needs a very strong program to help ratepayers understand the challenges that we're going to be facing over the next several years. Uh, so I want to just speak about briefly that the education program that I know during the campaign there were questions about whether that should be continued. I just want to speak up in strong support for that program because it, it's not just providing a little bit of money for folks who are out there doing good work. It also is the link for the board and the water district to the ratepayers. It has enormous value way beyond the small amount of money it costs. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak? Thank you, all of you that came up and talked to us. We appreciate hearing what you have to say. So I guess we'll go on to new business. First item is a resolution of appreciation for um, Chuck Faulkner. Sir. Any comments or questions? No? Okay. I would move approval of the resolution of appreciation for Chuck Faulkner. I'll second. Okay. I have a motion. <clears throat> Do we second all of these or not? Yes, they're separate. Uh, okay. Separate I'll, I'll second it. Okay. So, we have. Motion and a second. Do you want to call for a voice vote or a roll call vote? Is in your preference. A voice vote. Do we need it? Do we want to give a public comment on it? I asked if anybody wanted to say anything. Maybe they didn't realize I meant the public. <laughs> what do you do? Why are you recognizing it? Scott's town. Do you want to say something about it? Please call the vote. I don't know if you're bored, you're recognizing him. Oh, Madam Chair, may I comment? Oh, sure. I just, I couldn't hear him. He's, I didn't realize he was speaking. He's an ex board member. Uh, church, I, I recommend that we read the uh, individual resolution as we've done in the past. Yeah, there's a short paragraph on each. There's a short paragraph on the district secretary on each board. Uh, no? Read, read each resolution. Oh, sure. I can do that. Uh, go. I think that's what we've done in the past. Actually, I, I don't have a copy of it. <laughs> Madam Chair, I wouldn't mind reading it. You wouldn't mind? I wouldn't mind. Okay. Probably. Would it be okay with you if I read it? Oh, please. Okay. I will. <laughs> This is a resolution of appreciation for Director Boffman. Whereas on December 18, 2014, Charles Boffman was sworn in after being elected to the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And whereas Director Boffman faithfully and continuously served in his capacity as a Board of Director for a period of four years. In 2018, as the President of the Board. And whereas Director Boffman began working with the district as chair of the Community Outreach Citizens Advisory Committee, where he was instrumental in the district earning a transparency certificate of excellence and improving outreach to the public. And whereas Director Boffman was instrumental in setting the district up for a financially viable future to fund capital improvements and to build reserves. And whereas Director Boffman was dedicated to the proper management and protection of the district's watershed property, and the environmental health of the entire San Lorenzo River watershed. And whereas Director Boffman was deeply involved in the Santa Margarita Groundwater Management Agency and its formation, serving as one of the direct, director, excuse me, district's representatives and vice chair. Now, therefore be it resolved 
By the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, that Charles Boffman be commended and thanked for his years of dedicated service and that he has the respect of all who worked with him and that his efforts and dedication will be sorely missed. Passed and adopted by the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, County of Santa Cruz, California, on the 13th day of December, 2018, by the following vote of the members thereof. You want Did you want a roll call vote? Yeah, why don't you do a roll call vote? Mm -hmm. Director Smallman. Aye. Director Bruce. Aye. President Henry. Oh, aye. <laughs> Director Swan. Aye. Director Cole. Yes. The next item is a resolution of appreciation for Director Ratcliffe. Are there any public comments? Just have someone read that and please. Uh, have Margaret read the whole thing for her too, please. I'll have you read it. The resolution of appreciation for Director Ratcliffe. Whereas on December 18th, 2014, Jean Elizabeth Ratcliffe was sworn in after being elected to the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And whereas Director Ratcliffe faithfully and continuously served in her capacity as a direct Board of Director for a period of four years, in 2017 as the President of the Board, and whereas Director Ratcliffe began working with the district as a member of the Community Outreach Citizens Advisory Committee, where she was instrumental in the district earning a transparency certificate of excellence and improving outreach to the public. And whereas Director Ratcliffe was instrumental in setting the district up for a financially viable future to fund capital improvements and to build reserves. And whereas Director Ratcliffe was dedicated to the proper management and protection of the district's watershed property and the environmental health of the entire San Lorenzo River watershed. Whereas Director Ratcliffe was deeply involved in the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency and its formation, serving as one of the district's representatives. Now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District that Jean Elizabeth Ratcliffe be commended and thanked for her years of dedicated service, that she has the respect of all who have worked with her, and that her efforts and dedication will be sorely missed. Passed and adopted by the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, County of Santa Cruz, State of California, on the 13th day of December, 2018, by the following vote of the members thereof. Any other comments? Okay, could you please? Director Smallman. Aye. Director Bruce. Aye. President Henry. Aye. Director Swan. Aye. Director Holt. Yes. Next item is a resolution of appreciation for Director Hayes. Is there any public comment? Same thing. Uh, I know. I, it's fine with me. I don't need to be told every time. Sorry. Sorry. Would you like to read it? Resolution of Appreciation for Director Hayes. Whereas on June 21st, 2018, John Hayes was sworn in after being appointed to the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And whereas Director Hayes faithfully served in his capacity as a board member for a period of five months. And whereas Director Hayes began working with the district as a public member of the Budget and Finance Committee, where he was instrumental in ending the Lampico surcharge. And whereas Director Hayes was involved in setting the district up for a financially viable fund or future to fund capital improvements and build reserves. And whereas Director Hayes was dedicated to the proper management and the fiscal viability of the district, as well as the environmental health of the entire San Lorenzo River watershed. And now, there it, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District that John Hayes be commended and thanked for his years of dedicated service, that he has the respect of all who have worked with him, 
and that his efforts and dedication will be sorely missed. Passed and adopted by the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, County of Santa Cruz, State of California, on the 13th day of December 2018, by the following vote of the members thereof. Any, any comments? Uh, could you please call the vote then? Director Salman? Aye. Director Bruce? Aye. President Henry? Aye. Director Swan? Aye. Director Pulse? Yes. The next item is a discussion of the Board of Directors policy manual. And yes, uh, Chair Henry and the Board, uh, the Board of Directors policy manual is in front of you and is required for review. Uh, the policy manual is lengthy and I anticipate uh, considerable discussion. You might want to consider moving this to committee um, for thorough review. Um, and recommendations by the committee. It's totally your, it's up to you, but there's, I think there's a lot of changes being requested and it needs to be thoroughly reviewed by committee and board. May I add something sure. to that as well? Um, there would be nothing to prevent the board from completing its annual review by adopting this version tonight and immediately proceeding to consider changes. There's nothing about adopting reviewing and adopting the current version going forward that would prevent immediate review and ongoing changes throughout the year. Okay. Well, I know I spent hours looking at this until I was blind. Uh, how can we have some comment from, you want to comment? Yeah, let me, let me, uh, let me provide a little background because this item actually came from me. Um, and I wanted to get a little bit of uh, oversight into why it was being brought forward. Um, what uh, I attempted to do here was focus on the areas of the board policy manual that would support this organization meeting. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, depending how you look at it, this organization meeting falls immediately after an election and things may change at that point. I think that's what, what Rick was trying to get at is there's a lot of things that are going on. Um, so the changes, basically there are seven changes, um, and I'll go through these in a summary fashion, and then we can decide if you want to look at any of them tonight, none of them tonight, send the committee, what happens. That, that, that's entirely up to the board, right? This is only a proposal. So I'll be moving to two meetings a month, with meetings starting at 6 p.m., changing from Sturgis to Robert's Rules of Order, which is really more of a cleanup item since the Jurassic Parliament, the previous board followed was a Robert's Rule of Order based system, uh, modifying the order of business section to reflect current practice. That is, the current um, board policy manual doesn't match how the agenda is being organized right now, and so it was just cleaning that up. Um, enhancing the sections on the policies for public engagement and interaction uh, to address related items in the 2018 grand jury report and, by extension, the 2014 report. Uh, in that case, there is substantial changes, and so I opted for a wholesale cut and replace, even though if you look at the language, there's still a lot of overlap between the old and the new. Uh, the fifth item is changing to summary minutes instead of action minutes, along with some guidelines on what that means. And then probably an important point, given that we're already advertising for committee um, spots for the public, restructuring the committee, primarily combining finance and administration. Um, and uh, all of the flow down changes then that take place because of that. And then lastly, um, clarified directors are indemnified if they're performing their duties within the scope of their duties. So uh, that's basically the overview, and it is up to the pleasure of the board how we would like to do that um, uh, going forward. Director Swan, you have any comments? No, I, I agree with a lot of the, uh, the, the, some of the principles of Bob's espousing and the changes to it, but I do agree that I think it's a little presumptuous to vote on it now, even though we do have the opportunity to change it can, as we go ahead. I would uh, agree with Rick's assessment that we put it into a committee and let them review it more thoroughly and make sure that, um, uh, that we're all happy with the, uh, the suggestions, suggested changes. 
Commissioner Bruce. Thank you. Um, I would point out that the Administration and Policy Committee had made additional comments, as had I, which were not reflected in the comments provided to the public or to the board. Only Mr. Fultz's comments were provided to the public and the board. And I think that that fails the public in the slate's purported desire for greater transparency. I would very much encourage this board to take this back to the committee for a complete and fulsome discussion and for the changes that are proposed, whichever changes the committee ends up deciding on, that we <clears throat> allow our council to provide uh, her thoughtful input on, on their legality and advisability and, uh, and leave the details to the committee and bring it back at the future time. Again, that doesn't prevent the board from reviewing and adopting the, the policy document that stands at the moment and then forwarding, remanding to the committee any further discussion and edits. Um, I, I, I agree with Director Swan. Um, I, I really I read the whole thing and I agree with most of the um, the uh, changes, but I, I did. I, I, I did feel that it was a little bit premature, and I also believe that it should uh, go to the committee on uh, on the doc reviewing the document. Well, I have other things that I saw here that I would like to see changed. Um, I also know we don't have to reinvent the wheel that California Special District Association has <coughs> policies, cost $225 to get their whole ream of policies. They're all vetted by attorneys. They send quarterly updates if there's a change in the law. And I, I really, I don't have a major problem with what Director Fultz wrote. I, there are a few tweaks uh, as far as I'm concerned, but I also think maybe it ought to go back to committee, but I don't want it to be in committee for months, because this has been going on for months. So. Did you want to say something else? Yeah, I just have a couple questions. Then. So it's perfectly fine. I mean, I, I, again, this was to be presented and it's the point of the board to decide how to yeah. proceed with it. But I do have to ask a question, which is, will we then be um, governing our meetings by Sturgis, not Roberts? Will we be reorganizing our agenda per the current board policy manual? And will we go ahead and appoint committees? Because we then will have another committee that may, in fact, get folded later. So I, I just want to make sure we're clear on what all of that means. Because tonight we are supposed to appoint committees, um, board members to the, to the standing committees. As of right now, that means the separate finance and admin uh, committees. So uh, that's fine. But what it means is that if we do in the future decide to combine committees, there might be some additional dislocation for people appointed. So, something to think about. I spoke with council on that, and Bob was correct on that, that we would have to keep the standing committees that we have now, that any changes to committees would have to start in board policy manual. Um, so, that is, you know, I think that we get this board policy manual, that the top priority, I guess the admin committee, and try to turn it around in, in you know, an expedient amount of time. So we could have it either in the second meeting in January or very close to that. Um, yeah, you think you have ample time to review. I know it depends on changes and so forth to the, to the policy, but if uh, we can get it once or twice in front of the committee, I think we could turn it around and vote. I could certainly support that as long as there's time between the admin committee meeting and the time when the agenda needs to be published for the next meeting that I could provide comment and consider all concerns. Madam Chair, if I may just chime in in support of your comment that there are already fully vetted and we don't have to reinvent the wheel kinds of language out there and it is not the board's role to dive into the minutiae. We can trust that others have done that 
like CSDA who have done that for us. So I appreciate your comment on that. Um, any other board members? No. Uh, 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 community. <laughs> Please come up, Lydia. Thank you. to um, your policy manual. Lydia, um, could you speak up, please? Thank you. Lydia Hammock and Lompico, I'm apologizing to Lois. I didn't mean to be disrespectful. I, I'm sorry. Anyway, in regards to your policy manual, is it not a living document where you could go back in and make changes anytime you choose? Um, getting the process moving forward faster, I think, would be beneficial. Uh, I also see the other side. It would be great to tweak it, as you say, but can't that be done after it's passed? And then have the new committees, the standing committees that we put in place, do the final tweaks on it to make it more perfect. Thank you. Thank you.
you know, just pick a time. And pick a time when you're not really, really busy, like June or something like that, or you're on vacation in December. So September seemed like a good time to, to, to make sure that that got done. Um, now, when Brian edited it, I guess he, he took out September. He wanted to put in some weasel words, like, oh, whenever we get around to it, whenever we feel like it, whenever it's convenient or something like that. I mean, just, just put a deadline there. And, and um, you know, the world's not going to stop if the finance director doesn't get it done in September, but it's not that hard to do, so it's got to get done sometime. Um, anyway, September, those two places that say that, that's what I want to see in the board policy manual. If those have somehow gotten deleted, then um, I think something's been lost here that ought to come back. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm Nancy Macy, I live in Boulder Creek, and I also want to uh, let you know about my confusion about um, what was going on with the board policy manual. So many things were being deleted and added and then changes, and it took a while to go through it, and I was really uh, interested in that. Um, and I also wondered about the fact that it had been under consideration for a whole year and what happened to all of that. Um, I wanted to know if anybody else had actually had the time to thoughtfully assess the ramifications of some of the changes, and I sure was trying to, but um, it made me wonder <laughs> why these changes are being made and what are the ramifications. Will it encourage members of the public to participate, or will it discourage them? Um, I really love changing oral communications with public input, makes a whole lot of sense. There's one short phrase that gets removed in talking about uh, complaints that might force every complaint to go directly to the director when they could be uh, dealt with by someone in the office, the lower level of administration. Uh, so again, ramifications. Um, do we get to make, I love trying to make it friendlier, the, or, right, um, the procedures during oral communications or the public comment. Uh, do we get to have a normal conversation? Uh, is that, that, is that um, interpretation of the Brown Act correct? Has, our, uh, has Ms. Nichols had the opportunity to go through and look at these changes and look at the Brown Act and, and are the ramifications, uh, are the interpretations of the Brown Act correct? It really seems strange to me to prevent a board member from attending other committee members than those he's assigned to or she, since attending those meetings would enable each member to become way more informed on topics that they need to know about to make decisions about um, if they're only observers, as in the case now. So again, that's an interpretation of the Brown Act that I think needs to be looked at. What are the ramifications of, of putting the administration com administrative committee with the budget and finance committee? Um, is this an effort to cut costs by streamlining? It seems so obvious that something is going to have to give. What will it be? Is there something that will be shortchanged? Um, will, it, will it give one or another director more control over a broader range of issues, depending upon who's on which board? Um, so again, what are the ramifications? While obviously thought through at length and in depth by Director Fultz, uh, modifying the board's policy manual impacts so many aspects. I'm wondering if it sh shouldn't go through a more public process, give people a bigger chance to um, consider it, maybe even a, a workshop, because the, the public study session could, could look at what was proposed in Please the Please finish year your statement. As well. That's fine. No, we can finish. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, um, it really does seem to be a perfect topic, topic for a workshop because a public study could look at Director Fultz's ideas and what his changes are recommending. Uh, and the changes are already under consideration by the administration committee since none of us really know what those are unless you've been at that committee. Um, and that will help discern and, and uh, define the ramifications so that the public will be behind the changes and you know, we're all kind of getting involved in changes. So thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate the extra minute. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kate Jordan and I'm um, also from Long Pico. And um, I just wanted to make two comments. Could you speak up, please? Sure, sorry. Um, I'm, my name is Tony Norton and I'm from Long Pico. And 
One comment, someone was concerned about the cost involved in changing the meetings to <coughs> twice a month. And um, I don't think it was explained the reason for the change. <coughs> and it is for the benefit of the people of San Lorenzo Valley because for so many, um, how, I don't know how many meetings you've been to, I've been to several where one we were there after midnight. And the reason why is because there's always so many <coughs> different items on the agenda. So, and we all are always involved in so much here in San Francisco Valley. So, the reason why they changed it to two meetings a month was so they could allow us to not have to wait all night and go to the meeting that we're interested in. So, um, that's one thing. And now, um, oh, I forgot what the other one was. We can have to next time. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Art Lee. Congratulations, by the way, on being selected by the community for serving on our board. Um, I reviewed the whole document at my home on the computer, and I agree that we should retain the existing committees as uh, Scott Stan had written about. I think it, it, it uh, actually increases public transparency. And I don't mind the condition about uh, uh, combining administration and finance. That's probably a good way of uh, you know expediting administrative issues. So if it saves money, I'm all for it. Um, regarding the bi-monthly bi meetings, I think it's a good idea too to increase public transparency. So uh, I'm all in favor of keeping the committee structure in place and uh, go for it. Thank you for uh, being elected, and hopefully we'll have good, improved uh, relationships with the community. Thank you. I'm Jane Ratcliffe. I'm from Felton, and I had a couple of specific. I had a couple of specifics. Uh, one of them was uh, merging the admin and finance committee. Having uh, served on the finance committee, um, there's quite a bit of work. It's a core part of the director's role. Um, but my concern is admin. Um, it, the policy manual was in the admin committee for many, many months, and it never got out. And that indicates to me that there is more than enough work for that committee to do. And if those two were few, something, I'm afraid, would be shortchanged. Um, and I, I'm also dismayed that you know we waited for many months for a policy manual, and while I was a director, we didn't we didn't get to see the fruits of that long process. Um, so I would like to see, I like the idea that somebody had, I believe it was um, Nancy, about a workshop where different versions, not just um, Director Fultz's, but other people's input could be shown. And um, having never attended the admin committee meetings um, while I was on the board, I would love to see some of the work because yeah, I know you all were working on it. I'd love to see some of the work and some of the suggestions that were made during that process because it seems like it would be a, a wasted effort if we didn't get to, you know, learn from the, the work that was put in during those many months. So those were the, that huge committee I would be very concerned about because I don't think finance should be shortchanged and I'm concerned that admin may have too much to do to squeeze it in without something um, suffering. Any more comments? Um, I'd like to second what um, ex-director Ratcliffe just said. I think uh, the past chairperson of the admin committee has not had a lot of time to comment on this at, at this point. I think uh, that venue would be an excellent one for that discussion, an excellent place for that uh, discussion to take place. Um, and this is a very, these are very substantive changes to a very important document. And it should be done in a reasonably expeditious manner, but not a rushed manner. And the, the thing tonight feels rushed. I mean, there are even um, small details about this that uh, nobody else has noticed, I think. Um, I own a copy of both Robert's Rules of Order and of Sturges. Robert's Rules of Order is a 700 um, page docu okay, document. And I don't believe, uh, and the GSA, for which I was vice chair, had use Rosenberg's as, a, as something that um, new people to running uh, meetings in the parliamentary style could digest and work with. Sturgis is a good compromise on that. I would keep that uh, for a time being as the, uh, 
is the parliamentary guide for this. And I think in um, in the admin committee, uh, perhaps the uh, perhaps the admin committee uh, discusses its own merger with the finance committee. But it should be done in a way that people that couldn't be here for tonight, for example, uh, ex director Hayes is not here this evening and could not be here. And I know two people who I know are very interested in what is going on with this district that could not be here and come in publicly. So having a single meeting. Uh, for which this is not discussed is uh, in love. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Do we have any members of this admin committee here present today? Uh, well, yeah. Margaret. So maybe you guys could answer why has it been laboring for, I don't know, a year, six months, 12 months, however long it's been? Why haven't we got anything? We'll likely have a different perspective on it, but sure, I'd be happy to offer that. I mean, I'm just curious. But you need to talk louder so sure. everybody can hear what you we'll, just We'll likely have a different perspective, but I'd be happy to uh, talk about it. I think the actually the three most recent members were uh, former director Bachman and Margaret and myself. So um, we did spend a lot of time with this, and I think the um, basic issue from my perspective was a very fundamentally different way of looking at how to engage with the public and some of the specifics around how to be um, uh, more transparent, more interactive to the extent that we can within the confines of the Brown Act. And that's really what was trying to be reflected here in the modifications I made, which modifications I had made in various forms over the last two years of my service on the <coughs> admin committee. This has been discussed quite a bit. Um, and it was also discussed over the last uh, three or four months, and it was also discussed within the context of the last three or four months of the election, and it was also discussed within the context of grand jury reports in 2018 and 2014. Uh, we have discussed this at, at quite some length. The issue was we were never able to reach a consensus within, in my view, in the, in the committee, and uh, we did bring something forward to the board, there was a workshop on it, I believe, at the board level, and that was December of 2017, January. Uh, that was when we had the consultant in, and we went through the, the board manual, and it just seemed to kind of drop, and at that point, I'm not really sure. We got put on that. that. So, um, I, again, this is entirely up to the board's pleasure as to how to deal with this, but I would echo let's not put it back through that multi-month process because this has been discussed at some considerable length. No, it sounds like it. I, I agree with that. But, and I, but I'm just curious why it's, you know, what the reasons for it. And obviously, I don't think anybody wants to put it back into a committee where it's going to languish for months again. Right? Exactly. I mean, I think, as we've read through, a lot of the, the changes are really valid and, uh, and quite positive, I think, to the overall process. But... Margaret, did you have? No, Margaret. I absolutely do. Thank you. Um, I hesitate to throw Brian under the bus because he's not here to defend himself, but some of this had to do with staff capacity. There were comments that were provided by then committee member Fultz and as well by committee members Bachman and myself. I think my approach is very similar to what Madam Chair Henry said, about there are already template documents. There are already <clears throat> policy documents that have been vetted and proved and tried and tested and from, from other organizations and, and expertise that we can tap into. And I don't want to spend my time as a governing member doing text editing, doing, doing wordsmithing. If we can nibble around the edges and improve it for ourselves, that's fine, but spending a great deal of time wrangling over key, key words or specific phrases that won't matter very much, and we can guide our inter interaction with the public based on sound judgment and good leadership, I would rather leave the wordsmithing of a policy to our competent staff and have them bring to us their best recommendations from the resources that are, that are available to us, tinker with the edges, and move on quickly. Bill? Oh, I, I think it should go back to committee after that committee is formed, which may be 
a month or so, but that committee should have that this document ready for approval after that meeting. So and and, and then have it for um, board approval and discussion within two months, basically, and have some sort of you know time limit. So like you said, it doesn't just go back into this committee and forever. And I think there should be some sort of you know discussion to keep it within you know maybe two committee meetings or one or two or whatever. I want to follow up on a little bit of what, what Margaret said, because she's absolutely right. There are template documents out there. And in fact, we even had a consultant who does a lot of work for the CSDA come out and, and talk to us about um, various things. What I found about the template documents is that they very much reflect the concept that um, we talked about a lot over the last three or four months, which is the Brown Act being a ceiling for the board's interaction with the public rather than a floor. Everything that the CSDA, CSDA does, everything in the document today, represents that philosophy. I fundamentally oppose that philosophy. The interaction with the public, as required by the Brown Act, is a floor. It is the minimum set of requirements. And it is absolutely appropriate for the board itself to engage in deciding how the board wishes to interact with the community, the ratepayers, the public, the people that are supporting us. And so that is why I recognize there is value in the CSDA document, but it does not go nearly far enough within the construct of the engagement with the public. And to me, that was a real critical thing over the last three or four months. Um, and so that's why I invested my time in writing what I did. Um, there are many other changes in the, in the, that we could do in the board policy document, but what I'm trying to focus on right here is the fundamental things that address the issues that we've talked about over the last few months. Again, we can take it to a committee, but I would support that only under uh, some sort of uh, deadline that it get back to us very quickly. We do not need this. We have discussed this a very long time. Uh, we don't need to spend a lot more time on it. It seems to me that maybe a workshop would be the way to take care of this. Not a committee, but the whole board in a workshop <clears throat> going through this. Because like I said, there are some things they aren't major that I saw. Um, that I'd like, Nancy Macy brought up one thing, which was board members can't attend a committee meeting, that's not a Brown Act violation. It's discouraged. Mm -hmm. it, we shouldn't say they can't attend. It's discouraged, it's highly discouraged that board members, when there's two board members on a committee and a third board member or even a fourth board member shows up, they give information to those two board members on the committee by facial expressions, maybe shaking their heads, uh, moving their hands. That's why it's discouraged, but it's not against the Brown Act. So I have a little issue with that, um, as did Nancy Macy. Um, I, I, think that's a, I think that's an excellent idea because I think the uh, workshop will, uh, yeah. it'll, it'll stop it from going into a committee for whatever, and then in, involving the whole board and the public and everything will so if, get it through. The, I think it's an excellent idea. So if the five of us can't get it together and can't come up with something, we're never going to get it together and come up with something. <laughs> so, so why don't we just all sit down together all five of us, any members of the public who want to come and go at this. Madam Chair? And do it soon. Yes. Madam Chair, I have a motion. Yeah. You have a motion. I, may I make a motion? Yes, you may. I would move approval of the board policy manual as adopted December 9th, 2015, first part. Then I would further remand that board policy manual to one committee meeting to be followed up by a full board workshop on
on the result of that one committee meeting's input. Any agreements on that? With an amendment, I would support that motion. Sir, what is your amendment? The amendment would be, it doesn't go to a committee, it just goes to the workshop. Mm -hmm. A friendly. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'll just try. My feeling is I believe that, I think the workshop's an excellent idea, and I think it should, I think I would, uh, I approve that amendment. Right, so with the amendment that it goes to a workshop. So my amended motion is that we adopt. Bruce, before you go through it again, may I make a clarification? There is a resolution yes. in the board manual to readopt the existing policy for yes. 2019. So you could simply move to adopt that resolution and then add the additional condition about uh, it going to, uh, to a workshop. So be it then. So I would amend my uh, my motion to adopt resolution number 22 of 1819 to adopt the current uh, policy manual with the addition of uh, a remand to a full board workshop at a date to be determined by staff and our calendars. Everybody happy now? The earliest possible date? Earliest possible date. Uh, as Rick. implied by my motion, okay. Rick, I'll how second. early do you think that could happen? I'm not sure I should speak until the motion is adopted. Oh, okay. There's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a motion on the floor of the attorney council. It could be our first I'll workshop. Second, I'll second the motion. Uh, as as Mark said. Okay. It can be our first workshop, but if it doesn't go to committee first, I'd like a little more direction from the board on what they would like to see at the workshop. Do you want to see other agencies' policies? Do you want to see the CSDA boilerplate policy? I'd like a little, that would be the benefit of going to uh, committee meeting first to get a little more direction on what to have for the full board to see. I could work with individual board members, but. I, I, Personally, I'd be fine with seeing the C CSDA templates. That's something that we had talked about in committee but never really got into for us to review prior to that. Outside of that, I don't know that I need much more. Would we need a facilitator? Do we need to bring someone like Brenda Ives in again? Or do we want to see if we can have uh, someone from CSDA? You know what? It costs you. a whole lot of men. No thanks. <laughs> we'll be supportive. I, I think we can do it without a facilitator. Yeah. I agree. If we can't, then maybe we'll have to get one. Give us a crap and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we have a motion and we have a second. Okay. No more comments. And no more comments from the public. All right, you want to call the vote, please? Director Smallman. Aye. Director Bruce. Yes. President Henry. Aye. Director Swan. Aye. Director Pulse. Yes. Okay, next item, Board of Directors meeting costs. Okay, um, we had a series of, of chats, coffee chats, over the last few months, um, and one of the big questions and <coughs> we had, and from the staff and from the board of directors, was that the meetings are going lengthy and what would be the thought about going back to two months per month. So staff developed a cost so the board could see what the costs were of, of uh, a board meeting. And if we did go back to two meetings a month, what the cost would be, we thought that this information would be useful in, in helping you make your decisions. So the information in front of you is basically the cost uh, of the board meeting. And I'll turn it back over to you. Do we have any comment from... Yes, you want to go to the public first or board first? I'd like to go to board first. Okay, let's do board first. Mark, the director first. 
So, so having seen both both ways of doing this, two a month, one a month, I'm in favor of two a month. It's it. I I appreciate how significant a burden this is on staff. And I want to acknowledge that there is an awful lot of time and dedication that staff went into preparing the board agendas and making sure that the board members are prepared. Mm -hmm. But um, having two board meetings a month enables us to move smartly through our work. And I, I would appreciate having the opportunity for two meetings a month that are shorter. So one of the things I, I did was take a look at not only what the future costs were, but what some of the historical costs might have been if we use the same model. So I think in 20, I think we made the shift in 2016 or 2016, I think. So it would have been interesting to know what it cost in 2015. But in 2016, it looked like we had a total of 26 board meetings between regular and special meetings. And in 2017, I believe it was 21 total board meetings between regular and special. And so um, if we use the same kind of cost structure, more or less, um, we actually were probably paying um, like we were having two uh, board meetings a month just because of the fact that on average between 26 and 21, that's almost two meetings a month for two years. So I didn't see that there was that much difference in what the cost would be, though it would be interesting to take a look at that historical cost. I think there were some great suggestions that staff made about perhaps um, our uh, attorney participating remotely, which uh, at least one of those meetings, maybe two, uh, that would reduce the cost since the bulk of the meeting cost is involved in the, uh, in the attorney cost. And um, I think we might also want to look at the cost of, the, uh, of how we are doing our video and dissemination of the meeting information that's here. Uh, if there might be a way of being able to do that in a lower cost fashion. So I do think that the board needs to um, look at costs very closely for its meetings, but I think the advantage of two meetings a month just completely overwhelms the disadvantages, as I think Margaret very eloquently said. Um, and I think it will encourage people to come to meetings in a way that when the meeting can go to 11 or 12 o'clock at night, it just gets to be a real grind. And as a board member, I'm not sure that I'm going to be at my best uh, come 11 or 12 o'clock either. That's the, other, that's the other part of it. And uh, um, I'm also very mindful of the impact of staff. I'm hopeful that staff can work with us. Perhaps everybody doesn't have to be at every meeting. If we do workshops, uh, one of the meetings versus business on another, maybe there's a way of being able to mix it up. I, I think there's a lot of options here that are available, and I would encourage um, us to be as creative as possible about how to get our done, work done quickly, but also make sure we're engaging the public more. Director Swan, comment? No, I'm in favor of the, uh, the idea of going to two meetings a month. Figuring out a way to reduce costs along the way. If there's some way to structure the meetings a little differently than the full blown costs that we're enjoying for one, I would certainly like to explore those options. Director Um I, I really, either way is really okay with me. Um, I, I kind of leaning towards perhaps maybe the two meetings might be a little bit more efficient and wor worth the cost because it's, we're not, I, I don't believe we're really talking. I know it may look like a lot of money, but um, you know, may. That may that, that expense might be you know might be worth it, but I really I really have no problem with either either set up one or two meetings a month. Well, I'm in favor of two meetings a month, but I'm also in favor of cutting the costs of those meetings. The problem with only one meeting is they go on and on. Oh. And I think people tend to get a little crabby. <laughs> I would like to see everybody just smiling and being happy. <laughs> Not crabby. Uh, so I support two meetings a month. As long as we cut costs and 
we don't let any of those. I would like to see a cutoff time. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to have two meetings a month. They're going to be done by 9, they're going to be done by 9.30, or no later than 10, whatever. And I, I, I really think sometimes when you put a cutoff time, people don't talk so much. And let's face it, isn't necessarily the public who's talking so much, it can be us on the board, you know, chattering away. So, I, I really am in favor of two meetings a month if we're careful. So now, I would like to open it up to all of you to have your say. Ruth, can you look? She, okay, I just got the center. I'm Ruth Schaub, I'm Pico. My question for all of you and for you is, do you need the lawyer present at every meeting? Is it more important she's there or he for the um, closed session when you might be dealing with more precisely the issues? I mean, do you need a lawyer to tell you getting off the agenda? I don't know. So I, I ask all of you to think on that. More. I, I, it's a good question, and I personally don't necessarily think we need to have an attorney at every meeting as long as the board is well educated, understands the Brown Act, and is careful. Exactly. Um, and I expect all of you to be current and know your job and do it. Not to diminish what you do. But I think it's more important that you're there, or any of the attorneys there, for the closed session. Because that's when the hot button and that button is Thank you, Fred. Did you want to, can you walk over there, or do you want to stay there? I'll be back here. Okay. I particularly like the way that um, Lois said that she would like us not to be Crabby and be happy. <laughs> and I would be much happier and less crabby if I could hear. I wish if we're going, I've invested a lot of my time and energy into this, and I would like to continue. But if I cannot hear, I'm I'm very frustrated. Can we not use a mic in the future? Is there a problem? We're getting a yes from staff over there. Yes. From the boss. Thank you. That's a mic. I could only half hear the majority of people. We're sorry. You speak beautifully. You're always easy to hear, and you are, but there were many people I could not hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to play again from that woman. Um, I agree with President uh, Henry's. Uh, Observation and recommendation to have maybe at least two meetings, two meetings maybe only, but a cutoff point to reduce these long meetings and make it cost like. I also agree with the caveat that we don't have, we don't, there's not really a need for having legal counsel fly all the way up here for every meeting, unless it's a special uh, closed session for legal requirements. It's very costly or existing uh, legal representation. So that would be an excellent way of cutting costs. I agree with that completely. Thank you. My name is Suzanne Shetler. I live in Ben Lomond. And I agree with the direction we seem to be heading, which is to segregate the closed session and legal matters into a separate meeting. Looking at the agendas, they tend to be quite long. Are there some items that could be handled every other meeting? Committee reports, legal stuff, maybe some other items that don't have to be handled every single meeting. Let's see what we can, how we can rotate every other, probably not every third meeting, but every other meeting. Might be confusing for some people who are used to the current format, but we don't have to tackle every topic at every meeting. I happen to agree with you, and on that little note of what she was saying, would anybody shoot me if I suggest that we don't discuss the personnel system rules and regulations at this meeting, uh, that we have them at another meeting, 
and not to put you down or anything, Director Smallman, but both of your items could be done at it at another meeting. We can do that when we let's finish this item and then we get to those items we okay. can make with recommendations. Yes, sir. Finish oral communications. As Jim Mosier from Felton, I'm an attorney, although retired now. I just want to caution the board uh, about not having an attorney present, in, at least on the phone, uh, for these meetings. You may have noticed that we have a rather litigious tendency in this district, at least uh, among one person. Uh, and uh, mistakes can be made inadvertently, as was made um, uh, before that's led to some very difficult litigation. Having an attorney present, I think, is important, at least to be familiar. I personally would not want to be the attorney for this board if I was going to miss half the board meeting. Um, uh, even if you think you have something going on that doesn't require legal review, it may inadvertently, something could come up and it can come back to bite you. Perhaps having an attorney on the telephone could save some money, but I just think you want legal review uh, of your meetings and advice and when unexpected things can come up. Um, otherwise, you may find yourself having your legal costs go way up, uh, even if you're just trying a, a small savings leading to a large cost. Just a, just a caution. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, but um, <laughs> Attorney Mosher was a uh, library board member. Uh, and I attended library board meetings for years. Uh, the library uh, uses a law firm, I think they still do, they did then, and they still use a law firm called ABC Law, down in Santa Cruz. And ABC Law is the city attorney. It's a whole law firm, but it's the city attorney for the city of Santa Cruz. And the city of Santa Cruz has a tradition of uh, having difficulty with members of the public who want to speak. They, they, um, they, take, they abridge the Brown Act in many ways. And unfortunately, those traditions of the Santa Cruz City Council spilled over into the library board because they, um, they used that, term, that law firm. So um, I did sue the library board for Brown Act violations, and they settled with me, and they paid all my attorney's costs. So they were violating the Brown Act. But the interesting thing that I want to point out is that the attorney didn't come to the board meetings. So I'm, I'm quite surprised to hear Mr. Mosher suggest this because um, this was the standard practice of the library board was the, the, the attorney was never there. Um, and for me that was a problem because, I, you know, there were grant violations going on in the meeting and I really wanted to have the attorney there. It's like, hey, that's what I'm talking about, right? You understand me, right? Um, but the attorney wasn't even in the room. So um, this all got handled, uh, you know, through litigation because the attorney wouldn't show up. And uh, that was fine with Mr. Mosher for years while he was on the library board. So I'm really surprised to hear him say that there must be an attorney present for this board. And he certainly didn't insist on that when he was on the board. Any other comments on this item? Okay, how back to the board? Stephanie has a comment. Oh, Stephanie. I Lawyer joke? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just wanted to bring up, you know, it did put on the calculations, you know, the fact that it does take a significant amount of staff time to come and set up meetings at different locations. The different locations all have different acousticals, uh, all of that type of stuff. So having the, the ops building, you know, they did spend a lot of money, you know, getting the acoustics up and running there. If we were to do a route of, you know, streaming or doing our own type of stuff, I think that those are all valid ways of being able to reduce costs and guarantee the same type of quality of sound and everything for the meetings. And so I am a fan of single location. Yes, Director Holtz. Well, and on that note, I also would like uh, to perhaps take a look at a new facility that might become the permanent um, meeting room. Um, you know, Mr. Mosier is, is, was very kind in, uh, in, in explaining to me what the new library might be able to offer us, for example, in Felton. And so I, I, 
I think for right now, absolutely agree with that single location approach. Um, it is small, and uh, I'm hopeful that the excitement and energy that we're seeing here tonight continues for the long term and we get a, a really nice turnout every time. And if that's the case, the ops building, especially in the winter, might be a little on the small side. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that that's a great idea. If I, if I can quick uh, inject here, our next item is dates and locations. I think we to move ahead off of this item. Okay. This item is just to, to tell the board what the board being costs and we'll move to the next item, which talks about dates and locations. Not unless council disagrees or... No, absolutely not. Um, I think whenever the chair is ready to move to the next item, yeah. there's no need for board action on this one. I, I, uh, no other comments from the board then on this? Yes. Uh, so let's go to the meeting dates on 2000. Each year, the, the board selects meeting dates and, and times. Um, I did speak with council before the meeting. I'll let her speak more on it. That she feels that we can go ahead and uh, do additional meetings without changing uh, the board policy manual. On this item. Um, so if you have a, a calendar in front of you and this item is prepared for the, the current board policy manual that states that the meetings will be on the third Thursday of each month, um, if the board wants to select additional meetings, I do believe it's appropriate to do so. And I'll refer to council on that. Yeah, I agree with that. This, the resolution that's before you sort of reiterates the board meeting schedule that's in the board policy manual. This is an item of housekeeping that needs to be done to set at least a baseline schedule for next year. However, approving this does not preclude any further action by the board, either by motion or resolution or otherwise, to change the, the policy or set additional specific meetings. I have a question for you. Okay. Can we amend the resolution? Yes, that so, can be done. I mean, the, so we could insert into the resolution first that, and third. that it would be the first and, insert yes. the fourth, third, first and. Yeah, I, I've become concerned about those kinds of changes only when they're so complicated that we can't understand, understand what was done, but understand. that's no problem. Okay. And the, and the calendar you have uh, in your packet shows the, the current uh, third uh, Thursday month, and then we would, if the board so desires, you could add the first. There is a conflict in July, the 4th of July being on the uh, first Thursday of the month. I think the rest of them fall on. Uh, yeah, 4th of days. July would be first. Yeah, you may, you could always opt not to have them, only one meeting in July. There's nothing to say you can't have less meetings. Right. It's up to the pleasure of the board. I would move approval of resolution 23-18-19, ending public comment and further board discussion to read, uh, for 2019 as the first and third Thursday of every month, unless holidays force us to change. Second. Uh, was there any public comment on this item? Has the board considered looking at the second and fourth Thursday of the month for more flexibility? We're not really locked into the first and third. Thanksgiving, Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. Thanksgiving, Christmas. Oh yeah, Santa Margarita. Yeah, there's a bunch of conflicts with second and fourth. So we have um, any other comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second. 
Would you like to call the vote? Director Smallhead? Aye. Director Bruce? Yes. President Henry? Aye. Director Swan? Aye. Director Fultz? Yes. Okay. So, I guess we can, um, can I ask about eliminating those two items now, or do I have to wait till I get there? Well, I'm not sure, you may want to go to each item and ask the board if they have any changes, if they don't, we can move right through them and adopt them. Okay. And be done with them. All right. If they have something that they want to discuss, you okay. might want to consider that depending. But okay. a lot of these, uh, I think the legal council has reviewed, staff has no requested changes. You can pretty okay. much go right through them okay. if you've already reviewed. Them. All right. So the next item is respectful workplace. And staff has no requested changes. Discussion and possible action. Do you have no any comments? Uh, respectful workplace uh, policy uh, in front of you. I recommend that you adopt the resolution. Well, maybe it's worth clarifying. I think these are policies, and specifically the SDRMA encourages um, get review and readoption each year. And, and specify the board policy. Yeah. 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 And, uh, Director Bruce, I was just going to say um, I, I've reviewed and also have no recommended changes. So. Okay. Yeah. Director Smallman, no changes. Yeah. Okay. No. All right, I don't have any changes I, either. I, so I restrain myself <laughs> from making any changes. No, I'm just kidding. I, I have changes on any of the remaining. Heaven forbid you're restrained. I know. I know. <laughs> so we got a motion. Sure. I think we have public comment. Oh. Public comment. <laughs> I've said that so many times today. <laughs> Sorry. No, I just want to say I wish we didn't have to have a policy like this. I wish it was just common courtesy that we treat each other with kindness and respect. But I appreciate that you ex expect this of each other and we'll proceed with proper respect. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none. Could we have a, a motion? Okay. Uh, if I not. Would, uh, I, I, may I interject very briefly? Yes. And say, I, uh, thank you, Ruth. And very recently I had a, a conversation with a colleague who is my office's safety representative in the building. And it was a, an active shooter training that he was reporting on. And we shared anecdotes about how he, as a child, had been involved in a school shooting, like where, where his school, there had been a school, school shooting. And in prior careers, I'd been an environmental health and safety manager where workplace violence by st statistics was the most dangerous thing my colleagues and employees were likely to face. And I've known personally two people who were shooting victims, workplace violence victims. And it's so uncommon, it's so rare. But this respectful workplace policy is not <coughs> just, as Ruth suggested, can y'all just be nice to each other? It's also for us to take care of our employees, recognizing that they work outside, they work with heavy equipment, they work in the rain, they work with people who are sometimes very frustrated or very angry or sometimes just not like all there. And it's important that we empower them and protect them to be safe and that we provide the tools and resources necessary <coughs> to keep them safe even when there are, you know, especially when there are untoward things, unexpected things that can happen. So. Yes, this is a perfunctory thing, but we have this in place for a really good reason. And uh, I feel very strongly about protecting and, and, and empowering our staff, so I'm glad we have it. And I would move approval <coughs> of the policy. <coughs> okay. You're making a motion to yep. approve. Second. 
Okay. I think we're ready for you to ask for our vote. Director Smallman. Aye. Director Bruce. Yes. President Henry. Aye. Director Swan. Aye. Director Holt. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to uh, perhaps say we could talk about this personnel system rules and regulations later, but if you've all read it and you don't have issues, right, you have then to. maybe we can just go ahead and approve it. Right, uh, uh, resolution number 17-15-17-18, which establishes the personnel system rules and regulations for 2018. The District Legal Council has reviewed uh, the district personnel system rules and regulations. There are no recommendations or revisions to the existing personnel system rules and regulations. It's recommended the board review and adopt a uh, resolution. And again, this is another recommendation from uh, the district risk management carrier. And by having these policies, we do receive incentive credits with lower our insurance rates. And all board members had a comment on this that wants to? I'd like to move adoption of resolution number 211819, personnel system rules and regulations 2019. I'll second. Any comments from the yes. audience? resolutions but I question whether that's the effective use of this board's time for something that hasn't changed and in this particular case is there another way we could handle it at a lower level maybe staff could do the review and then do some touchstones for the public and then get back without having it brought up discussed and take up time in board meetings to approve something that's not changing I just I just question the validity of that use of time at this level. Secondly, I see that uh, the staff and the, the current district council has uh, reviewed this procedure and doesn't recommend any changes. This is the second year in a row this procedure has not changed. And owing to the fact that from my reading, case law on employment is an ever-changing landscape. Uh, I believe, for example, in the last couple of years, since there's been no changes, there's been at least two definition changes about exempt versus non-exempt employees that may or may not impact this, but I just wonder, we've had staff review, we've had legal counsel review, have we had a professional HR person review this? And would that be value added? I agree with you. Just a question to think about. Thank you. Yes. I would just like to say that this is generally something that we put on the consent agenda. But because we have so many new board members, we wanted to give everyone the opportunity to have something to say about it. So that's the only reason it is not put on the consent agenda, which would be no comment. It would just be okay. Right. Right. Do you want to say something, Rick? Very thoughtful. What? Thank you for doing it. Okay. No, I, I mean, I didn't answer to his question. Um, it's required to the board by a special district risk management. It's required by the board to review these and to adopt. And that's to, to give the highest level of the district the buying off on the policies and procedures. So it, it is required for this board to do it. And it's also, it, it ensures our consent. Um, as far as HR, um, it hasn't been reviewed by, it's been reviewed by legal counsel, but not by HR type of firm. I'm sure if it was, there would be the following changes. Um, we, you know, we work out of it now and we haven't had any difficulties, but that's not saying that there would not be changes. Okay, so.
So we have a motion and a second. So would you like to call the vote on this? Director Smallman? Aye. Director Bruce? Yes. President Henry? Aye. Director Swan? Aye. Director Pulse? Yes. <laughs> okay. Next one, sexual harassment. So, has anybody, has anybody got a, a problem with how this is written at all? No? No board members? Do you have a comment? No, both state and federal law prohibit sexual harassment. Uh, on December 21st, 2017, the board adopted uh, Number 14-17-18, which established the Santa Rosa Valley Sexual Harassment Policy for 2018. District Legal Council has reviewed the district sexual harassment policy. There are no recommendations, revisions to the significantly existing um, sexual harassment policy for 2019. I recommend that you uh, adopt that resolution. I move adoption that the board adopt resolution number 19-18-19, Santa Rosa Valley Water District Sexual Harassment Policy 2019. Second. Uh, public comment. Okay. No public comment. Would you like to call a question, please? Director Smallman. All right. Director Bruce. Yes. President Henry. Aye. Director Swan? Aye. Director Pulse? Yes. <coughs> okay. Oh, so the next item is uh, Board of Directors District email. That's a good one. Yes, with the, the, with the, the current election, uh, the three new board members district is moving forward with updating our contact information for the general public on our website. There are several ways that we can list contact with the board of directors. Um, we have in the past have more general mailbox that was used by all board that came through to the district and then we forwarded out or we had the use of personal emails. Um, we now have the capabilities of doing a, a direct district domain um, for each director if so desired where you would have your own email address just like a district employee where you would log on to the district server, retrieve your email and then you use that for sending email. Those emails would not come to the district, they would go straight to the individual director or you could use your own personal emails or the common BOD emails that would be forwarded to you. There are some issues with record retention uh, about emails that I'll let the district, district council kind of take over and, and explain that to you. Um, we are recommending uh, that you think about consider using the district domain server and use the district domain uh, email address as we would be able to maintain those records. Um, and, I'll turn that to District Legal Counsel. Yeah, while it's not required by law to use an email address uh, with a district domain name that's maintained on a district server, it is um, something of a best practice that has good legal reasons for doing it. Um, it's also a cost-effective way to manage document retention. So I personally would recommend that approach, but it's not legally required. There are other ways you can do this. Um, the reasons why that is advisable is um, because if we get discovery or a Public Records Act request, um, having the emails on the district domain server allows us to search as needed to make sure we're doing a comprehensive review and providing the required documents to the requester. It helps preserve and protect and ensure that we are responding adequately to public requests or discovery requests. That helps protect both the district and you as individuals um, because you know, legal and staff can manage that process and sort of take responsibility for producing the right documents. It's more cost effective, it's more accurate, it also helps protect 
your privacy because a situation doesn't arise where we have to sort through your personal emails or something to try to figure out what has to get produced in, in certain situations. Um, but again, that said, there are reasons why directors may have, you know, prefer other approaches, and I, you know, I'm not saying that it has to be this way, but please consider it a, a, as a way to proceed because um, it does save costs when legal matters arise. It kind of balances your privacy. You know, nobody at the district is going to routinely look at these emails unless we need to go in there and produce them for some legal reason. And under those circumstances, staff and district council can kind of res take responsibility for doing that correctly instead of it being on, on, on you to do that. So can we each do whatever we want, or do we all have to decide on the same thing? I would defer to the district council. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, well, I think you should think about it. You don't have to make a decision. There's no vote tonight, but I think you should think about it as, as we're moving ahead with setting up yeah. You know, well, well I really like what. You know, there are some drawbacks uh, by having you have to log on to our server to retrieve your emails, and you have to log on to our server to send an email. Versus yeah. if you're getting your own personal email, it comes in. But then there's the drawbacks that Tina says you're commingling district emails with your private emails. Yeah. Um, it's totally up to each director on how they would like to. So we can it. each do whatever we want. That is correct. I do believe, you know, as we move ahead with the, with the policy manual, I think Gina's going to want to see us have some reference to record retention uh, in the policy manual, whichever, whichever way you go. Okay. Yeah, I would say if, if the board does not uni universally adopt the practice of using San Lorenzo Valley District um, domain name server to manage email, then I would like to propose um, a uh, amendment to the board policy manual to uh, better address record retention issues when you're doing it through your private email. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and your you email are one, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do what she said. Okay. <laughs> uh, Director Fultz. Yeah. A couple, couple qu uh, comments and a question. Um, this came up during the last year at the admin committee meeting uh, because the board of directors that the BOD at SLVWD was not actually um, forwarding off to an SLVWD.com domain for each board member. It was going to the personal one. So when you tried to respond, it got a little bit clumsy. That is, the email would come back on a different address than when it was sent on. And I, and I didn't think as uh, one of the public members that was a, a great practice. So I fully support each board member getting um, an slvwd.com email address, assuming we're going to retain that BOD at, because then they can just all forward directly to each of us at the same time. And we can respond back in that, and it'll be great. Um, how much does it cost per email address? I think it was $4.20. Or four twenty. Yeah, that sounds about like four twenty five. Four dollars and twenty five cents per month per employee or director. Right. So about fifty bucks a year per director. Two hundred fifty bucks for the year. Um, I'm, I, I do believe that would be a great use of, of funds. Um, so that those are my comments. And your, your emails are kept on our server. Though if you have our domain, it's nothing that I even have access to. We take an IT guy to. To mine those emails off our server. It's an exchange server. It's an exchange server, that's correct. Yeah. So, Director Swan, what do you think? Oh, I like that idea. I'm up with that. It's good enough for Hillary, it's good enough for Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> He's the funny guy. <laughs> Director Bruce, long awaited. I think it's a great idea. Director Small. I have no comment. I can go either way, yeah. but it makes sense to me. Well, I really like it. Uh, uh, okay, comment from the public. Hi, uh, Lydia Hamrick on Pico. Uh, speaking from experience, um, if you use your personal email, it's out there, the world will use it, even after you're no longer a board member. I, I still get email from bookkeeping jobs, from a wildlife organization I ran, I commission stuff. I have my 
the emails that I was required to use bounced to my private email so I didn't have to dig through all the various different email accounts that I was responsible for. And I made the mistake of answering off my personal email instead of logging in and answering off the email that I was responding to. So my suggestion would be this is a great idea and you can possibly have it bounced to your private email. Just don't answer from your private email unless you want the world to have that. So, thank you. Look what happened to Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Tony Norton from Long Pico. And I just really appreciate it. I've been, I've been disturbed for a year, well, for a long time, that the board members did not have an email address that we could reach you at. So, um, I think this is a great change if you go for that at SLB. Any other comments out there? Such a quiet room. Okay. All right. Um, committee appointments for 2019. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Point of Is there a directive we're giving staff? Was, uh, or the staff know what we want? Well, it's not like I heard that you're all in favor of moving forward to the district domain. Um, email, so that's the way that we were going to move forward. I just want to make that explicit. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So you don't need a directive, right? No. Okay. okay. Um, committee appointments for 2019. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. So we have. Right now, we have six standing committees and a multi-agency body, Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. Ad hoc committee, I think that's probably done. I don't think so. Well, we should talk about it. Yeah. I, I am, I'm not really in favor of ad hoc committees. Um, okay, beside the point. So, evidently, I can appoint people to these committees as board chair or board president. I can appoint. Well, the board president uh, can recommend uh, appointments for the board's approval. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, the admin committee, I would like to recommend Director Fultz and myself. And do I need to ask each now? Is the rest of the board okay with that? Or? Just a, a, a suggestion, because there aren't specific appointments um, listed in the board packet. My suggestion would be for each um, committee that you're considering to go out for public comment while you're discussing that particular committee. Okay. Um, and before I make a suggestion. Either way. You can either make a suggestion and then go out for public comment or you can go out for public comment first. I, I think as long as there's public comment for each of the committees, that should be sufficient. Okay. okay. So. What? Will it be one vote or a vote per committee? I would leave that to the chair, but just a suggestion. That, that's my point of order. What would you like to do? What would I like to do? It, it's, I think it's up to you. Do you want one vote for all committees or one vote for each committee? No, I think each committee. Let, let's okay. hear what the public has to say. I did recommend uh, Director Fultz and myself for the admin committee. Is there any public comment out there? Um, um, Chuck Hoffman from the board. Um, my suggestion is for some continuity that all of the remaining directors of who are sitting on a committee remain on that committee for the time being. There will be plenty of openings, okay, on all those committees for um, appointments from the newly elected, and um, that would be a good way of doing. It. I think um, I will make a comment uh, for yourself, uh, Ms. Henry. 
uh, President Henry, is that I think um, you would be a good person to be on the GSA, for example. And that Margaret will be, you know, somebody who, you know, this is going on to the next one, but uh, Margaret will be a good person for that because she's been an alternate on that. So I would leave people in their positions for the time being and then um, and fill those have you from the new um, electives and then if need be, uh, revisit it. Elections have consequences. Who cares who the old committee members were? Who cares? You got a clean slate. Do whatever you think is best. Um, but what I would, this is where um, previous boards had a whiteboard. And they would start jotting on the whiteboard. Because I think you should make all the committee assignments at once. Don't just make one committee assignment and then go to the next and next. Because at the end, then maybe something's out of order and you want to re rejigger it or something. So I think you ought to do them all. And uh, talk it through until you can get everybody satisfied and then go with that. Well, it might be faster if I did it that way. Hi, Mark. Thank you, Ben Long. I would agree with uh, Mr. Holloman's uh, Holloway's uh, comments uh, that we should start from scratch, uh, uh, assign all the committees, and then have each committee have its own uh, individual meeting and make uh, essentially uh, look for new members of those committees as you know uh, candidates in the future meetings beginning in 2019. So I think I'll just say all the committees and be done with it. Okay? <laughs> Make it easier on the standing committees. So, Budget and Finance Committee, I would like it to be Director Fultz and myself. Engineering and Planning Committee, I'm thinking Director Smallman, and I don't know that you can come, right? Right. So, would you like to be on the engineering committee, Margaret Bruce? <laughs> I would very much like to be on the engineering and planning committee, and I would also like to be on the environmental committee. Okay. All right. So, Director Smallman and Director Bruce on engineering. Uh, <coughs> Director uh, Bruce on the environmental. And why well, I, I, Bill is really interested in the environment. I know that. Um, yeah, so. I, I want to be on the environmental, and I also want to be on the Santa Margaret Groundwater Agency. Okay. So I I need um, I guess as as do I director what a, as would I I would like to be on the Santa Margarita. Um, the okay so I could be on the environmental committee with director Bruce. The Long Pico Assessment Oversight Committee. There are no directors on the Long Pico. Right. No, they've gone before, but they're just, okay. Um, education Grant Committee we're not going to deal with tonight. I was planning on bringing that to the January meeting, a uh, uh, staff right. report with all the background right. on that committee for the board for okay. So, with the standing committees, Wait a minute, I'm on three things, three committees. I don't want to be on three committees. <laughs> well, I, I was going to suggest that on the Santa Margarita that that would be yourself and Steve. Well, I'm, I haven't even got there. But if I'm on the admin committee and the budget and finance, and then on environment, that makes me, and then Santa Margarita, that makes me on everything, almost. So... Mm. How about you want to be on the environmental committee? No. How about you, Director Fultz? Um, I've already on two, and I think that's 
I would have to go off one to be in it. So Mr. Smallman said he would. Mr. Smallman could be on it. Yeah, we'll go we'll, 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 Sorry, are you agreeing to the Environmental Committee now? I thought you said no, no. but I, I can't partly hear you. Fine, but we haven't had dinner. Oh, you said yes. I couldn't See you hear you. Next sorry. Time. Sorry, sorry. Where are the microphones? Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to, you know. So. I want to get on the Santa Margarita thing. Um, well, but the Santa Margarita. Uh -huh. um, I, I've been interviewed three hours by the facilitators, uh, facilitator. I've been going to meetings for months. Uh, Steve Swan has gone to some meetings, and you were interviewed also, right? Uh, scheduled, but didn't. Oh, you're still scheduled. Yeah. Okay. Madam Henry, I've also been the alternate for the district since Director Hammer's just. Um, right. I would suggest that Margarita continue in the alternate position. So, okay. So that, that was, I, ad hoc committee, I. Well, so we go back to San Margarita, who is huh? your, who's your. Okay, uh, so Director Swan, myself, and Director Bruce as an alternate. Thank you. Okay. So the ad hoc committee. It's up to you. I do believe there's still work to be done on that. At least review where we're at on all of that, and then make some. Then you can make uh, decisions. Uh, on the grand jury. On the grand jury, on the tasks that the grand jury and the district said that they were going to do in the response. I think we still have and we're working. I, I thought they had to do a response already. Oh. Yeah, well, we it's execution of the action items. May, may I ask a question? Can we change our grand jury response? I do not believe that is possible. It may be possible to supplement? supplement. And I can look into that. I would I'd very much like to know if we can do a supplement. If we can, I would like to continue with this being discussed somewhere. I don't know if it needs to be an ad hoc committee or another place, but I think we need a supplement to the grand jury report. Just for information, the um, ad hoc, it was contemplated when the ad hoc committee was formed that at some point it would be replaced by the liaisons, the district, the board liaison, with the flat-off that um, the response to the grand jury report said that the district would move to at some point. So it, the process could be overseen by those liaisons rather than the ad hoc committee. If the district chooses to appoint with them. So, have we seen any of those? I mean, are the reports out there where we can see? They are all publicly available on the Santa Cruz County website. At the website, okay. Would it be Yes. Would it be possible to bring us back after you determine whether we can do a supplement? I mean, there's no need to take action tonight on the ad hoc committee. Okay. Right. Okay. I'd, like to, I'd like to find that out first. So if we... Uh, so you're... Go ahead. So... I just want to get down what staff is going to provide the board. When staff is... What staff, what the board would like staff to provide? On the ad hoc committee? Yes. Ah, specifically, um, I would like to know if we can either amend or supplement the grand jury response. And based on that answer, we may choose to take further action either with an ad hoc committee or perhaps another committee. That would still be a discussion item. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, public comment. Um, I'm Ali Kirk, the um, dismissed the Long Pico um, Ladoff Committee. And at our last Ladoff meeting, we discussed the possibility of you assigning the fifth member to our Ladoff Committee this evening. 
would that be part of this discussion? No. It's, All right, it will be in January. Uh, the, and the reason why I'm concerned about that is we have a workshop meeting on the 28th to discuss our new charter. And before we can you show mean January 28th? January, yes, sorry, January 28th. So if you don't appoint someone until, when, when would you plan on? Can we do it the 3rd? January 3rd. Okay. Uh, or, the, or the third meeting of the month, which is the 17th. May I just point out that we, um, the um, applications are open until the 9th. Okay. Although you, you talked at that meeting also that you already have um, a candidate that is... Perfectly. I think there's two candidates. Two candidates right. already. So you, didn't, you don't really have to. You can keep those. We need to have somebody, we need to have a meeting before our um, It'd be the charter meeting, charter meeting it but that won't give us enough time for us to get together to decide how we're going to run that meeting because we're going to be having a workshop with the public to discuss our charter. So we need to have a meeting so we can discuss how that is going to be organized. And, and I understand that, but... We should wait till the application the process. The application period hasn't ended, okay. and the next, for sure, board meeting would be the 17th after that yeah, time maybe. period. i a suggestion. To me, this is an incredibly critical um, appointment that needs to be made as soon as possible. <laughs> Would it be possible to have a special meeting, one agenda item only, to appoint someone to the latter of the committee meeting on the 10th? That would be great. Up to the board. As long as I, my only concern is that you know, we're out, we follow the procedures that we've established in the past, we're out. And as long as we meet that deadline, you know, after that deadline, we're asking for applications. Um, I, it's up to the board. The, the I don't see any reason why we could, not this council would have a reason. And that would, if we had a special meeting, we'd still have time, if you have it on the 10th, to schedule it and, and post it. The meetings are all up to the public. It doesn't preclude anybody <coughs> from attending the Ladock meeting and participating. I mean, it's not like they're closed meetings. So yeah. if we don't do it, I'm sure everybody will attend and, and comment on the charters and so forth. They do, they're only down to one member. It, it can, it's a pleasure of the board. How do you like to proceed? So, your meeting is the 28th, which would be 11 days after the 17th. So, what meeting do you want to have before the 28th? This is going to be a workshop meeting for the public. So the seventh, the twenty eighth is a regular Ladock meeting. It's not a regular Ladock meeting. We decided at that meeting that that's going to be a workshop. Okay, meeting. that's going to be a workshop. But there's eleven days after the seventeenth where we could. We'll still. Will that give us enough time to put, to set a meeting? Well, and, could, and, and then, um, well, I guess we can... You've I already got a meeting set, set, right? Have, but we have to have a meeting before that to, to work out the details of this workshop. So we don't have to. We can set it before that. We don't have to have this fifth member just to set the meeting. Okay. So Could I ask what, what kind of meeting do you want to have to work out the workshop? Chair sure, Henry, just a caution. This is going pretty far off the committee appointments. I, I, I get that. But. <laughs> okay. That, that this, this is just to talk about how we're going to be. It was a last minute decision that they decided to make it a workshop meeting. So we need to decide how we're going to engage the, the public to help us with this charter. That's what was decided at that meeting. Okay. Great. So, um, okay. Thank you. Lydia? Yeah, hi. Sorry, I was just saying. Uh, Lydia Hammond of Lompico. Um, is there any reason why a board member who lives in Lompico can't be placed as a board member person on LADOC, or does it have to be a non board member? Just, I don't know if he was interested to be a non 
it to be on lot up, but I see that as a possible solution to the missing fifth member. You always seem to have a missing person on there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a miss. I had to get off of that one. Um, anyway, um, my suggestion would be to just put a board member on there if the board member wishes to be. He lives in Lot Up. I think he would be a good Lot Up member. <laughs> Again, from them on really quickly regarding uh, a little bit of homework here, or uh, housekeeping rather. Uh, before we make the voice vote on this motion, I'd like to have all the assignments, all the committees named out loud so we, we have public record clearly for the public. I think you're a little confused. Okay. Um, all right. Um, what the admin committee. I said, I said Director Fultz and Director Henry, Budget and Finance, Director Fultz and Director Henry, Engineering Planning Committee, Director Bruce and Director Smallman, Environmental Committee, Director Smallman and Director Bruce, Um, and then Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin, uh, Director Swan, Director Henry, Alternate, Director Bruce. Could everybody hear me? Okay. Is that what you wrote, Rick? That's what I got. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, the board want to discuss this? And there, there, like I said, we still need the ad hoc committee who's going to be on that? Or is it, or is it? Um, we don't have to do oh, that tonight. Okay. Post it. Post it. Yeah, we're not going to kill that. Okay. We're not going to kill that. Okay. Not tonight. Correct. Okay. Any other questions or discussion about those committees? Okay. I assume we're all in agreement. So is it just consensus or vote or how do we do this? I recommend a motion. A motion. Okay. Do I have to repeat that? <laughs> we, we got it. We got it. <laughs> uh, a motion. I'll make a motion that Director Fultz and Director Henry are on the admin committee. That Director Fultz and Director Henry are on the Budget and Finance Committee. Director Bruce and Director Smallman are Engineering Planning Committee. Environmental Committee, Director Bruce and Director Smallman. Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency, <coughs> Director Swan, Director Henry, as voting members and one alternate, Margaret Bruce. Second. Okay. Do you want a roll call vote? Yeah. Director Smallman? No. Director Bruce? Yes. President Henry? Aye. Director Swan? Aye. Director Pulse? Yes. All right, so the next items are uh, Director Smallman's items on field trips. Um, they're I, no, L, not I, L and M, field trips for new and existing board of directors, and then board members senior staff and public committee members training. So L, uh, do, you, do you want to talk about that now or should we talk about it? Oh uh, sure, yeah, this, we wouldn't be making any decisions tonight on this um, <coughs> and it won't take, take very long actually. Okay. Um, it, probably, it will probably move into the next meeting but I'm looking for board consensus to develop, um, I've had 
just a little bit of background, I think as board members, um, we would uh, serve the public better if, if we got uh, some sort of like field trips, uh, particularly with me with the being on the engineering committee. Um, there was a couple things that, you know, I basically really didn't even know about that the district already had that we've been trying to, you know, I'm trying to be helpful uh, on that. And then I think it would not only include, you know, just going and field tripping the facilities, but some of the inner workings, the software programs, et cetera, that were on the, the basic structure of how this would work. Um, you know, it could be one big special meeting, uh, with the presentation, you know, with the staff, or it could be um, maybe uh, renting a van and, and driving around uh, the, the touring the uh, thing. None of this is definitely not a high urgent problem, but it, in the beginning of the year, I think it would be really helpful to somehow structure. So I guess what I'm sort of asking with is that perhaps that I got with staff to develop some sort of schedule um, based on what, what you comments that you would have to say on how this would exactly work but it's just basically and then obviously some of the directors already really you know like director Bruce has been on the um, board for a while to eat some of the which uh, might not be quite as necessary as the new board members and myself to do have to think but anyway it obviously would have some sort of fiscal impact because staff would have to um, do that. So anyway, um, I just wanted to have some sort of core consensus to put together the package for the meeting in um, January, um, uh, some sort of structure how this would work exactly, and then vote at, 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 at that time. Sure. Um, so when I first started on the board, staff was kind enough to offer um, and I reached out and availed myself of several opportunities to do ride-alongs, if you will, to have um, orientations to the different sec sections of the district to see how the inner, you know, the pumps, the pipes, the tanks, the software, the, the maps, the charts, the files, how <laughs> everything worked. It is burdensome on staff, and it's an awful lot to remember. So I would just encourage the new board members to coordinate with staff for what Bill's suggesting and to go along with one of, I, I think it's what's important to note from, from Bill's recommendation is there's an awful lot to dive into. If the district staff could compile some kind of an orientation binder with key charts, references, maps, statistics, <laughs> kind of the, the background of the district in thumbnail to go along with those tours, whenever we might avail ourselves of them, would also be helpful. That's a good idea. I actually got a little bit of tour of the district years ago when we were talking merger in Long Pico and got to go through some of the things. And I know that Rick has some ideas about this. Uh, and I, I think leaving it to staff would be a good idea to get it back to us about what they think. Uh, no, I think it's a great idea. I mean, you know, we should be able to spend some time with the staff and get some presentations from the staff on what they're doing, how yeah. they're doing it, what they're, what's working, what's not working, yeah. and a little more detailed understanding of the tanks. As we know we've got some direct contacts from some customers with tanks sitting above their house yeah. that apparently leak and yeah. flood them out. And I'd like to get a little better understanding of those types of issues that are facing us in more detail. Yeah, you know, during the uh, election season of 2014, the candidates actually all got a tour put on by the esteemed tour guide, Mr. Hutchers there. It was great. Um, I, you know, to me, one of the things that um, we talked about over the last few months is, is a series of workshops. And as President, I'm hoping that you'll be able to work with uh, Rick on that, where each um, is function basically, you know, we start out with a presentation overview, the virtual tour from uh, operations, engineering, environmental, and finance of, of what's happening. And then I absolutely think it'd be great to do the field trip portion of that too, particularly on the operations and, and potentially engineering side. Um, 
when we did that in 2014, it was incredibly helpful to be able to see all that. And we didn't even really scratch the surface. As I recall, we went to a handful of locations, um, and, but it was great. And everybody walked away, I think, really with a great appreciation of what uh, we have and what staff has to maintain. So, any comments from the public? Lydia? I'm sorry, I'm kind of worried tonight. Um, what do you have on people? I think it's a great idea that everybody become familiar with everything that they're overseeing. Um, LADA was supposed to have received this same thing, and that never happened in the two years I served on LADA. We didn't have like a group tour as a meeting, per se, that was publicly noticed. If it's publicly noticed, Will the public be allowed to tag along and maybe avail themselves of the tour? I'd like to see it. Get all. Thank you. Rick, would you like to address that? There's several ways we can do it. And we can write the board, full board goes. It, that is one of the complications, but we can work out the logistics. It is a public meeting. We have rented vans, many vans in the past. Um, we get a handful of public that likes to attend um, on those tours. You can go individually with staff, we can set it up. It isn't a public meeting, you have a, a particular site that you want to, you know, if, uh, you have received a complaint about a leaky tank, if you want to go look at that leaky tank, the director of operations would be more happy to take individual directors out, and we don't have to know the status of meeting. But staff does uh, agree that it's good seeing, because you're going to be seeing bills coming through, you know, a million dollars here, half a million dollars there for projects. And it's always good if you can put a vision to that bill and see what we're spending the money on and, and, and look at that. It is very time consuming. And as Bill said, you know, you, you'll take a long time to see a lot. But we'll pick the key areas. And then we always ask directors, is there something on your mind that you want to see that's particularly uh, you have an interest in? Um, I like to wait till the weather's a little better. Um, it's not cold, wet, or muddy. Something. Most of the sites are gravel roads. Of course, the treatment plants aren't. But you know, I definitely want to get you up and look at the lion slide. Uh, that's a price tag estimated could be up to as much as five million dollars for repair. So it's really good to get the board out. It helps and it makes that job a lot easier when we come to the board and tell you, you know, about these issues and problems. So you, yeah, that's a great idea. Any more public comment out there? Okay. Uh, well, just, I mean, we can just say we want some information on this, right? Do they have to have a vote? To we'll we'll right? get a schedule and get it back to the board so at least the board knows, yeah. you know, well, roughly that you know, we have forgot about it. We have a schedule. I would like to wait or, or make sure it's decent weather because it's raining. It just yeah. It's really a going to mess up our hair. Yeah. <laughs> James? Well, we could say cost too. I do have a five-seated seat, truck, so yeah. not renting a van. I could take out small groups at a time as well. Yeah, they could be different days because maybe everybody just, can't you know, come. With the, you know, you remember the Brown Act on a public meeting and those type of things. We can, we'll work that out. Yeah, I, I think I think maybe we could put some scenarios. I think we could probably divide it up too, because there's different things. There's there's driving around, but I think there's also people, directors that are interested in seeing other parts of the district in the office and those sorts of things. We could maybe develop some sort of um, strategy that was that's cost effective and, and, and can bring it back to the board at a later date. Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right, your next item was um, Brown Act training and stuff. I know that Rick is contacting a lot of places uh, about getting training, and, and, and he's going to be presenting that to us at some point. Yeah, the district sector is working, reaching out to a lot of different agencies to, to see what type of schedules and costs <coughs> are available. There's a lot out on the internet for webinar type things, but I do believe the board is more interested, and plus we have committees 
that we want to um, supply training to, we have more of a workshop type training where everybody's together. So it's a little more difficult, but it's out there to bring somebody in. Um, there's several different ways we can move We're trying to get that scheduled for sometime in January, and we will bring that back to we understand that that's okay. very important. To, to yeah, I, I think there might have been some confusion because I think you're both trying to put something on the agenda that were sort of similar. Um, the one, my thought was, uh, it's, it goes directly to one of the recommendations on the um, grand jury report, which I have on the menu, um, um, on, the, um, on the agenda, on the, the memo that I created there. And it was one of the, I think it was one of the, Recommendations that I think might have been kind of overlooked. I know that we mainly focused on um, Ladoff and responding to the grand jury, but um, a member of the public made clear to me too that there was that, that, that one specific recommendation. I don't have it right in front of me, but um, it was basically uh, the, the the public to um, to have to better communication. I mean, members of the of the, um, not just directors, but the, the committee members, and then the committee members, uh, including Ladock and everybody, that their interaction with the public to smooth that over, basically. And there's on the packet, um, there is a, a, a firm. Um, so I, I think what I, I'm sort of asking in this regard is perhaps to contact that one particular firm. Um, and then come back with the meeting in January with a proposal of what they, and give them all the information on what they think their training could offer to help with that one particular grand jury recommendation. And what, from reading the, the information on uh, their website, they, were, they looked like they were um, like one-on-one -on -one sessions that were uh, one hour, but and in all that, I can also ask them if they also have just basically come and have like a big you know, presentation to the whole, whole board on what they recommend on how to, to improve that relationship. So, but anyway, um, so I, I'm just asking for your comments on whether you think that this is something that the board would like, uh, you know, to find more information on about and bring it to the meeting in January. I think yeah. that. But and I think this is kind of mixed up with uh, some of the other brown. But I, I, I think, I, I know what you're talking about, yeah. I saw it. Yeah. But we're trying to avoid spending way too much money. And they look like, I mean, I haven't talked to them, I don't know what they're going to cost, but they're like, <clears throat> we have all, so many consultants and so many this and so many that that we're paying for that I I don't know that I mean we need Brown Act training we need uh, uh, how to avoid the kind of problems that happened before because of conflict of interest we need that kind of basic training the training you're talking about that you show there well, that sounds great and fun but is it going to help us? I mean, it might help us to be better people. I, I, I won't argue with that. But hopefully we're pretty nice people anyway. Um, but I, I mean, we could check and see how much it costs. Well, that's, but, that's what I think I was yeah. just asking for is, 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 is to bring it yeah. back to the board to, for consideration yeah. in January. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'd be fine to find out more about it and specifically what it costs. I mean, yeah. The training does look valuable. If it costs $10,000, I'd say no. If it costs, you know, $1,000, let's talk about it. You know, it's that kind of thing. We just don't know. So let's find out. Okay. Is staff supposed to find out, or is oh Mr. Smallman going to do that? Staff will look into that. Staff will look into that. So I think we're to end. Guess who's up? Can I um, comment on what and you just talked about? So what? Can I comment on what you just talked about? 
Sure. I, I, did, I, did I miss it already, or did I? I? I thought we talked, but go ahead and talk. Um, so I've always found that the uh, a really good reference on the Brown Act is the League of Cities. Uh, they have a handbook that's written for high school graduates, basically, but it is footnoted. So if you are curious about one particular point or something, it'll tell you where to go look it up. It may be in a state law, or it may be in some kind of a court case or a court thing. Um, so that's a really good handbook on the Brown Act. Um, so I got a little confused here. Are you just talking about the Brown Act, or are you talking about the board? We're talking about everybody. Everybody. Okay. Everybody getting training. Um, and so there staff, is, there staff is, also. There is AB 1234 required training. Yes. So I assume that this is going to cover that. AB 1234, something that elected officials are required to do. And yes. there's a bunch of courses online. Uh, many years ago, I took one of these courses for free. Yeah. Uh, and I, I said I was Ryan Coonerty. And then when it was all done, it printed out a nice certificate for me that said I was Ryan Coonerty. Um, so I wanted to know what the training was myself. And um, actually, that's one of the things I wanted to mention is that with the last board, I heard at some point that um, board members, maybe not every, I don't know, maybe some, but some <laughs> board members have taken some CSDA training. So CSDA's got an AB 1234 thing, and I think it was 25 bucks or something, online course for 25 bucks. I didn't want to pay 25 bucks to take that course myself, but I, I really was curious. I wanted to take the course and find out, how could somebody not know this? How could, how could somebody take that course? I mean, maybe it's not a good course, but I was I really wanted to be able to take the exact same course so that I could go talk to the board member and say, how can you not know this when it's right in the course that you took? But uh, the 25 bucks was enough of a hurdle that I, I just figured out that. Well, I know I'm right and they're wrong, but well, well. I, I did take, I did go to Sacramento and take California Special District Association training. It cost a whole lot more than 25 bucks, but it was great. I would recommend it for everybody. Okay, so now I am going to give the attorney the floor. Thank you, Chair Henry. Um, procedural history with an emphasis on history and procedure. I'm only going to be talking about um, <coughs> events that are publicly known and pu part of public court records, etc. So, um, of course, I'm a lawyer, so I have to have a disclaimer. I just started it a moment ago. Here's a little more about it. We're only going to discuss uh, information that's a matter of public record. All of this comes from various um, public files and so on. I'm not warranting the truth of this. All I'm saying is this is the best history I can put together based on what I've seen in the court record. I don't personally know what happened in the events leading up to this, uh, you know, the present state of the Holloway and the Vieira cases. Um, my involvement in these matters was pretty limited until about the middle of 2018. So, you know, I'm relying on records in order to piece this together. Of course, privilege and confidentiality and legal advice and work product are privileged and have to be kept confidential. That limits this presentation to essentially factual issues. I, I will do my best to answer questions, and certainly there will be an opportunity for public comment. Um, but I may, and I apologize if I have to do this, if you ask me a question that gets into strategy, 
um, you know, estimates about the litigation, those kinds of things, I'm not going to be able to answer those kinds of questions. But I'll do my best. Okay, so now we got to rewind. We've got to go back to the beginning of, of how all this started, uh, the events leading to the Vieira and Holloway litigation. It goes back to 2010. Former board member Terry Vieira's wife was a real estate agent was the listing agent for a residential property at 1130 Rebecca Drive. Um, it's at this point a matter of public record. Mr. Vieira had a stake in the real estate agency, um, and ultimately, as we'll go through in the course of this discussion, his wife earns a commission from the, the transaction that the district's involved in. Um, so his wife earns a commission, the agency earns a commission, he has an ownership stake in the agency. So September to November of 2010, this is really well where the events leading to these litigations started. Um, the district is interested in purchasing this Rebecca Drive property to expand the neighboring site of water tanks in need of rehab. And Rick probably would know more about the specifics of this. Um, on September 2nd of that year, um, then district manager Jim Mueller asked a former uh, board member of Vieira for information about the property, which Mr. Vieira provided to Mr. Mueller. Um, Mr. Mueller, the district manager, then proceeded to negotiate the purchase of that property for the district and executed the transaction documents on behalf of the district. Right after Mr. Vieira is, is contacted on September 2nd, this uh, closed session item appears on the board agendas um, related to the negotiation of this property transaction where Mr. Mueller is identified as the property negotiator. Um, Mr. Vieira informs Mr. Mueller and the former district counsel, Mr. Mark Hines, of his financial interest in the sale through his wife's commission, potentially his ownership in the, in the real estate agency. Again, I don't know exactly how this disclosure occurred, but I know from the meeting minutes that it did occur. Um, the meeting minutes reflect that Mr. Vieira publicly announced an income conflict and he recuses himself and that he doesn't participate in the board discussions about the property negotiation. Um, later, towards the, towards the end of this time period, Mr. Vieira ultimately does vote to approve district bill lists, which included expenditures related to the property purchase, um, such as inspection and pest control fees and other things that typically go with the property purchase. And I'm not opining again on the, the legal import of these things. I'm just giving you sort of a recitation of some of the key facts that come up later in the cases. So now you've got to fast forward several years. Um, it's about four years later, November to December 2014. Mr. Vieira is coming off the board. Um, Mr. Holloway um, commences his lawsuit alleging violations of these government code provisions in connection with all the facts related to the sale. Um, the lawsuit names several defendants, including Mr. Vieira, Showcase Realty, his and his wife's real estate agency, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, and um, Mr. and Mrs. Dildeen, who were the homeowners who sold their residential property to the district. Excuse me, uh, were there, was it one lawsuit or one lawsuit with multiple sort of actions? And was the district named as a defendant in all actions? It, the original complaint wasn't really clearly pled in terms of specific claims, but it did mention political reform act violations and a conflict of interest violation, and it named all of those defendants that are up there. So it, it wasn't, it doesn't clear, it didn't clearly at that time connect specific defendants to specific claims. Okay, so the lawsuit does seek specific remedies or damages. Um, these things give you some sense of which of the, uh, the causes of action are pled against which defendant, and I apologize, that's getting a little bit technical. Um, but uh, it, sort of going back to more general terms, the complaint sought to have Mr. Vieira disgorge, in more layman's terms, pay back the uh, $13,050 commission that went to um, the real estate agency and his wife. It sought to have Mr. Vieira pay treble penalties under the Political Reform Act. So it sought a court <coughs> declaration voiding the property transaction, um, so essentially undoing or unwinding the 1130 Rebecca Drive um, 
property sale to the Dildeens, and it sought to have the Dildeens repay um, all the money they received from the district for the property, which would be in the order of, and I haven't done a fine analysis of this amount, but it would be in the order of about $500,000, maybe up to five fifty. dollars um, And it, would, uh, it, it seeks to have the defendants pay the plaintiff's attorney's fees and costs. All right, so we're still in December 2014. This is the very beginning of the lawsuit. Um, Mr. Vier, the district and Mr. Vieira, presumably the other defendants, were served with copies of the complaint. Mr. Vieira contacts district council. Um, we have an email chain that was made public last year regarding this discussion. So what the quote here comes right out of the publicly released email. Um, where Mr. Vieira asks for legal representation in this case. And Mr. Hines, then district council, responds to that email stating, I believe you're entitled to defense and recommend that this be done. Um, again, yes, Mr. Foltz. Was Mr. Hines' email authorized by the board before he sent it? Um, that I would prefer not to get into in a public setting, but I'm happy to address it in closed session. Okay, and what is the basis upon which Mr. Hines made that recommendation, legal basis, what, what law, what code? Well, there again, I think we should get into that in closed session. Well, because actually, that's the Government Claims Act. That's, uh, it's like Section 820 or something in the Government Code. The Government Claims Act is when a director is sued, the agency, you know, you know, it invokes the Government Claims Act and the agency makes all these determinations about whether they're going to defend it. Well, I agree that it's fair to infer that this is an invocation of um, Government Code Section 995. Um, but when we're talking about really getting into the specifics of who communicated to whom about what related to this, it does start to get into a privileged area, so I'm not going to go much further than that. I, I, I think it's, in answer to his question, though, um, the Heinz's communication with the era occurred outside, before the board ever saw it. It was never agendized, ever, uh, until after that had already happened. Yes. Yes, that's correct. That's all a matter of public record. Um, and if you want to know more about that, I would refer you to the district's cross-complaint against Mr. Hines and his law firm, which gets into this in, in a little more detail. Um, so there are public records, though, that would answer my questions? Is that, I'm, I'm a little confused. Well. Because I haven't been in closed session yet, so I'm completely ignorant. I'm yeah. like a member of the public at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, understand this, this is, this is pretty far outside the box, and I have to be really careful here to avoid privilege waiver issues. Yeah. I wasn't there for me to start saying, to start getting into anything that's beyond what's sort of written in the public record, records involves a certain amount of speculation, and maybe also calling upon knowledge that's outside of what's in the public record. So that's why I'm being careful. I understand. I mean, I, I understand the caution. I think this is something that we want to grow into a little bit more, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's one slight thing I noticed. Um, the lawsuit was filed while Chidera was still on the board. Okay. But, sir, yeah. Are we going to keep this to question after from the public? Or are we going to cross talk back and forth? I would leave it to the chair's discretion if it gets, if it we just want to comes to out of hands. Yeah, I just don't want the conversation to cross talk to get out of hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Try to no keep it to, the end. to our regular. If it gets out of hand, okay. we'll stop. Okay. So, um, so the, the board, yes. The emails between Mr. Hines and Mr. Vieira were before this was on the board's agenda. Um, when this was before the board, the board voted, and this is a quote from the agenda item, or from the minutes, to defend the board and former board member <coughs> Vieira. That was the board's decision. Um, going forward just a little bit, by a month to January 2015, the district um, agrees to sell the Rebecca Drive property now that it's gotten what it needs in terms of the water tank to new homeowners for approximately $186,000. Question. Is it appropriate to be selling a piece of property that's in litigation? 
That was part of the litigation that far. Right? Yeah, that I, I, I apologize, but I'm, I'm not going to get into it in this context because it's an opinion that's really not part of the procedural history of the case. It just it seems inappropriate to be selling a piece of property that's part of the litigation case that's ongoing. Go ahead. Um, okay, so we're going to get hit a couple years at once here. Um, in the early stages of the case in 2015 and 16, the district and showcase realty, the, the, the realty firm, successfully challenged the validity of the complaint as against them. Um, the trial court, and we'll get to the appeal later, but the trial court determined at that time uh, that a non-governmental plaintiff lacked standing to bring this type of action um, against these defendants. Then, because only the, the Government Code 1090 cause of action applied to these defendants, the lawsuit was dismissed as to them. Uh, Mr. Holloway and his attorney appeals from the dismissals, and of course there's more to be said about this. Okay, so 2016, the case keeps proceeding against Mr. Vieira because keep it, he was not dismissed from the case. His, his case is still pending in the trial court. Um, he's still being represented at that time by then district counsel, Mr. Hines, pursuant to the board's approval of his defense. There's a mediation which is unsuccessful and the case goes to trial at the end of 2016. So December 2016, there's a, there's a bench trial in front of the judge. The trial court rules for Mr. Holloway. Um, finding, and these are things that essentially come right out of the court statement of decision that Mr. Vieira violated the political reform act, that he had a financial interest in the decision to purchase the in the district's decision to purchase the property, that he provided information about the property to Mr. Mueller and voted on expenditures for the purpose of the, for the purchase of the property. And the court, and this is, is a quote out of the statement of decision: he did not have an evil intent in violating this um, section of the political reform act. Mm -hmm. What's the significance of no evil intent? That is, would again involve the legal opinion that goes a little beyond what's in the document. So I apologize. I'll defer that to closed session. Um, okay, early, now we're on to early 2017. The trial court enters judgment. For those of you who, who aren't familiar with um, court proceedings in any level of detail, it's typical for there to be a decision and then judgment gets entered subsequently with the specifics of what that decision means for the parties. The judgment orders Mr. Vieira to pay um, the amount of his wife's commission plus an amount of 11.4% that represents show his ownership interest in showcases portion of the commission for a total of, let's just say roughly $9,500. Half was to be paid to Mr. Holloway, half to the state's general fund, and it also orders Mr. Vieira to pay uh, 116,000 sum in attorney's fees. Now this is, a, this is a judgment against Mr. Vieira, Mr. Vieira appeals. So now there's two appeals going on. At this time, there's, the, there's Mr. Holloway's appeal from the dismissal of the 1090 case against several defendants, and there's also now this appeal by Mr. Vieira from the judgment that was entered against him. These are not the same, they're proceeding on separate tracks. A few months later, the board votes to stop all financial commitments to the Political Reform Act case. This is a quote from the report out of closed session. At this point, the district stops paying Mr. Vieira's legal bills. He still has the appeal pending. Okay, September 2017, Mr. Vieira submits a claim to the district. The claim demands that the district fulfill its duty under, to Mr. Holloway's point earlier, this is government code sections 995 uh, and 825, uh, demand that they fulfill their duty to represent, defend, and indemnify him against any judgment or attorneys for fees, awards, et cetera. Essentially, he is um, invoking code sections that um, he says require the district to continue to defend him and pay his judgment. Doesn't one of those codes say that the district can stop paying any time for no reason whatsoever? And there again, I'll defer it to closed session, Mr. Fultz, and we will get into that. There's three reasons. All right. Um, yeah, I'm really trying to stay away from the reasons why the district did what it did and stick to what happened. Um, and I know a lot of you would like more information about the reasons why, and I just can't get into it in this context. Um, 
So now we're getting, in, you know, this is getting pretty close to recent history, spring to summer of last year. This is the 1090 appeal um, that Mr. Holloway's attorney took from the dismissal of several of the defendants, including Showcase Dildeans and the district. The Court of Appeal reverses the trial court, saying that Mr. Holloway does have standing to sue under Government Code Section 1090. Um, that sends the case, nobody appeals to the Supreme Court. That sends the case back to the trial court for further proceedings. That was roughly July of this past year. Um, so now the case is back in the trial court under Government Code Section 1090 against the previously dismissed defendants. So now, you know, separate proceedings, all, it's all part of the same big umbrella, but these are different sort of procedures. This is actually a different case. Mr. Vieira now sues the district on his claim that he submitted in September, alleging that the district wrongfully terminated his, its defense of him, its legal obligations to defend and indemnify him under those code sections we just mentioned. It also alleges that Mr. Hines and his law firm at Atkinson Verizon uh, violated fiduciary duties owed to him as his attorney and that they were negligent in their representation of him. This complaint um, seeks damages and injunctive relief and attorney's fees. Um, I think it's fair to say that in really general terms that this is an attempt to move all the costs of the litigation over to the district and the district's former attorney. Um, May 2018, um, SDRMA finally appointed counsel to help defend the district against Mr. Vieira's lawsuit, not Mr. Holloway's lawsuit. What about the 1090? The 1090 is part of Mr. Holloway's lawsuit, and so there's, there's no There's SDRMA. no insurance covering that at all. We don't have insurance appointed counsel in the Holloway case. Okay. The district files a cross, now that Mr. Vieira has sued Mr. Hines, the district <coughs> files a cross complaint against Mr. Hines and Atkinson, Atkinson Verizon, alleging a variety of things, including professional negligence, breach of fiduciary duty, fraudulent concealment, breach of contract, and equitable indemnity. Um, Question? Can you elaborate on what fraudulent concealment, what was concealed? Is that part of public record? Yeah, it's, it's in the cross complaint. Um, let me try to sum it up. Uh, in a way that's not too technical and lawyer speak. It's, uh, I believe, I want to be careful because I'm not sure exactly what we said in the complaint off the top of my head, but it's along the lines that um, Mr. Hines was perhaps not uh, providing the best legal representation to the district at the time the case was filed because he was trying to cover up mistakes made in connection with the underlying transaction in 2010. It didn't have anything to do with discovery. <clears throat> discovery? Discovery for the lawsuit. I mean, fraudulent concealment sometimes goes oh, to- Oh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't relate to anything that was done in the lawsuit. Okay. Um, if you look at the cross complaint, it has to do with essentially the actions that were taken in 2010 that led to all these proceedings, and then what the attorney did when the lawsuit was initiated in 2014. Okay. So the old board, uh, which uh, ex-president Bruce was a member of, uh, accused him of concealing from the board, from themselves. Um, I, I'll refer you back to the cross complaint for any further details about what's alleged in there. Um, okay. Summer of 2018, uh, and maybe I, I may even have left out some details here. So keep in mind that the 1090 cause of action against Showcase, the Dildeans, and San Lorenzo Valley Water District is back in the trial court. We get our first case management conference in that part of the case, because the Political Reform Act case against Mr. Vieira has now gone all the way to trial and is up on appeal. So now we're back in the 1090 case in the trial court. We've got a case management conference. Uh, Mr. Holloway's attorney represents to the court as part of their CMC statement that he's presently opposed to mediation. That's a quote out of the CMC statement. The Santa Cruz Superior Court takes it upon them, themselves, himself, the judge, to coordinate the Holloway and Vieira cases so that they'll proceed together, which essentially means that when we go to court on one of these cases, we're going to court on both. Um, they're not actually combined. 
uh, with each other, so the proceedings are still sort of technically separate, but we go into court at the same time on both cases. So there's different attorneys on both cases. We go see the judge at the same time, sort of a simple way to say that. Um, we very recently, just within the past month or so, um, there, there were a couple of disqualifications, and the case is now in front of Judge Timothy Volkman. At our last case management conference on December 3rd, Judge Volkman <coughs> concern, confirmed that he intends to continue to preside over both cases. We weren't sure. We were getting sort of bounced around from courtroom to courtroom and judge to judge, and now it looks like we're going to stay in front of uh, Judge Volkman for both cases. Uh, Mr. Holloway's attorney on December 12th represented to the court that he'll be filing a such summary judgment motion regarding the 1090 uh, case, which he said would be heard in February. Uh, I don't know if that's really going to happen or not, but to be seen. In the meantime, the Political Reform Act case against Mr. Vieira remains pending on appeal. And actually, when I wrote this, <laughs> um, there was no hearing date set just yesterday. Uh, we saw the filings indicating that both Mr. Vieira's attorney, or, I'm sorry, yes, Mr. Vieira's attorney and Mr. Holloway's attorney have waived oral argument. So that means there won't be any hearing date set. The court will simply decide the appeal on the papers and presumably issue a written decision. Um, let me think if there's anything else that's happened the last couple days to matter of public record I can update you on. I think that is it. I apologize that it was like a day out of date in this, uh, in this presentation. So again, you know, Q&A will be limited. I've done my best to answer questions. I'm happy to take comments and answer any more questions that I can answer. I'm just curious. I mean, uh, for years, this has been hidden. It has been kept very close to the vest. And now I'm wondering what the motivation is for this open kimono. Well, my understanding is that it was requested by a board member and had to be agenda for that reason. Um, this, this is unconventional, to be sure. Um, but it's, it can be done to the extent it focuses on public records and procedural history. This is all public. This is all public information. Right. So why wasn't this done earlier? Why wasn't this it done when there were outcries in the press banner for this information to be made public? It's all public. public sense, once it goes into court, it's public. But to provide transparency to the public, a summary like this that could have eliminated all of those problems in the past few years could have been Maybe this could have been done well, on the website. I mean, I, I don't think this really eliminates <laughs> any of the problems, but to the extent that, you know, the board and the district are comfortable doing this, and it certainly, this would have been a much harder thing for me to do a year ago or six months ago than it is now. Now that I'm essentially handling the district's representation in the Holloway case, we don't have special counsel anymore. I've had to become more familiar with the cases. So it didn't take a lot of work for me to put this together. Um, and I'm much more comfortable sort of knowing what's public and what isn't. I mean, this is, this is a tough and unusual thing to do. And um, I guess, you know, I apologize if this would have been helpful earlier. It would have been a very difficult thing for me to do earlier. I appreciate it. Thank you. I do. Yeah. Uh, but it, it would have been, I think it would have eliminated many, many more problems if it had been made public earlier. Um, I, 
Okay, I, I feel like I want to say something, but I guess I'm not exactly sure what to say. Um, so, first of all, I want to say, I'm going to say that um, I discovered 1090 violations at two local agencies pretty much at the same time. One was the library board that Attorney Mosher was on, and the other was the SLB water boards. I found both of them at the same time. Uh, what was going on at the library was that uh, Mike Termini, who just ended his term as mayor of Capitola, he was the Capitola representative on the library board, and he was doing business with the library, which is against the law. Section 1090 says uh, a board cannot make a contract in which a board member has a financial interest. Can't make a contract at all. Um, it doesn't matter whether you, the board member recuses himself, the board can't make the he walks out of the room, the board still can't make the contract. That's what Section 1090 says. And it's been the law in this state almost since statehood, in, in one form or another. The reason that I know this is because back when I was researching this, before the case was ever filed, I found uh, the Attorney General has a book on conflict of interest, and there's a chapter on Section 1090. So if you you can look at the book online, you find the chapter on 1090. You only have to read a couple of pages, and you will find that you will realize, I do not want to get close to this. I do, this, is, this is like the third rail. You know, you get electrocuted if you do this. Um, now, there's a phenomenon that lo in local government where if, if you find a law violation, and frankly, I have found several law violations by this district. When you do, and you go to the attorney, and then, or, or you go to a board member, and they say, oh, our attorney says it's all good. Like, like at the library board, the attorney didn't come to the meetings, but the board members would say, oh, the attorney says it's all good. Everything's good. It's all good. We're not doing anything wrong. So what do you do when you when you face with that kind of a situation where the attorney just flat out is wrong on the law? And um, I guess what I've discovered is one thing you can do is you, you sue the agency. Um, when I sued the library board, well, no, I didn't even sue, I, I sued the library, I, I didn't even sue the library board on the conflict of interest. I brought it up to the board. And within a couple of months, Termini gave all the money back. It was $30,000. Um, and the uh, attorney retired, and the library director retired. So I felt that's a job well done. I brought the evidence, I brought it to the board, and within a couple of months, the library director was gone, the attorney was gone, and the board member paid back $30,000 to the public, to a public agency. So I wish that this district had handled this thing the same way. Um, because at this point, the district has spent a quarter million dollars defending the indefensible. This is indefensible. Board members are not supposed to be doing business with their agency. And it's just flat out. It, it, and, and what I wish would have happened, what I've always thought is, what if this were a school board? I just have to believe that if this were a school board, eventually one of the trustees would have said, you know, before you got to 250, and I think it's probably heading over that now, but before you got to $250,000 to defend a board member's financial transaction, some board member would speak up and say, we've been entrusted with this money to educate children. Why are we going down this rat hole on this? I mean, I think it ought, ought to relax a little bit. Um, I don't know what exactly, uh, so I have to tell you that one of the main purposes of my lawsuit was to evict or eject Mark Hines. Um, I came to the board in early 2015 when there was a new board, four, almost four years ago, and I had a piece of paper that had a dozen code sections on it. And every one of those code sections was a story about something Mark Hines was wrong about. There were a dozen of them, and they, and I mean, I gave up at a dozen. They, were, they went, went on beyond that. And every one of those could have been a story that I could have talked for five minutes about what, what that was all about, how he was wrong about it. Um, and that would have taken an hour. To, but I just said, this guy's made so many mistakes. I was really hoping, I mean, I got pleaded with him, get a second opinion. Please go ask a second opinion. Because Hines was the one that caused this problem in the first place. The district never should have bought the house, okay? Um, now, I talked to Rick Rogers at the time. I mean, I, the first time I ever heard about this, I, I thought to myself, why would the district buy a house? It didn't make any sense. 
And I asked board members, and I asked staff members, and I got consistent answers. There were two reasons that I was, was told. Can, uh, can you wrap this up? Well, anyway, um, yeah. You know what? You don't have to make any decision tonight. I know you're going into closed session later. I don't think there's anything you have to decide tonight. I'm, I'm always available. Um, I know. I, but, I'm, not, I'm not trying to shut you down. But. And, the, and the fact that at this point the district is suing on this, again, it's kind of like the library board situation. I feel like, well, I've done my job here. This was what it took to get that guy out of this district. And Bob and I followed the whole process by which the current district council was hired. Bob and I spoke in favor of the current district council. Um, so that was an important thing that needed to happen at this district. And I don't know any other way that I could have. If, if I had not done this loss, Heinz would still be here. He would still be here, and people would still be saying, oh, it's all good, everything's fine, everything's good. Um, so that was one of the things that was necessary. Now, the other thing is there were lots of different lawsuits that I could have picked. And the reason I picked this one, I'm trying to get people, private parties, to pay back the public agency. I'm not trying to hit up the agency, and I'm not trying to get you to spend a lot of attorney's fees. And it pains me to, to have, it pains me to have your attorney talking to my attorney. I mean, we're just chewing up attorney fees and um, <coughs> and in the mediation thing. So, uh, you know, ex-president Boffman brought up the mediation thing at the debate a couple months ago. He said, oh, Holloway won't mediate. Well, first of all, I don't want to see Gina Nichols in mediation. I don't think I can get anything out of her. I don't, I mean, if you've got anything to say to me to educate me about this, go ahead. Um, if you want to get me in mediation and browbeat me and, and try to trash talk me and tell me this case isn't worth anything, I'm not interested in hearing it. At this point, I've bought a master's degree in this subject, and I'm going to see it through. I mean, I, I have to see the answer. This is a void contract, void from inception. You know, in the oral argument uh, in the spring, Shannon Jones was the attorney for the showcase, and the Justice Elia asked her directly, did the board member have a financial interest in the contract? And she started answering, said, hey, if you're going to make an argument, just say no. And he asked her again, did the board member have a financial interest in the contract? And she said yes. And I was kind of amazed, because I think this is the kind of thing you'd like to prove in court. But she admitted flat out to the court of appeal, yes, he had a financial interest in the contract. There's nothing else for me to prove. That's why my attorney's going to go for summary judgment. If you have a financial interest in the contract, it's void. And so I guess in a way that's the answer to Mr. Mosher. Yeah, it's void, and I want that half million for this district from private parties. And who the private parties are are the bad board member, his partners, and his clients. You know, and I hope there's some insurance to cover it, but I don't really care. I'm trying to get half a million dollars for this district. I understand that, but I need you to. To buy that equipment directly and that he would install it for free. And what he paid back on his own, which was the right thing to do because Mr. Holloway was right technically, we understood that. The library director made a mistake. He gave an additional $30 donation to the library. He did not pay back money that the library paid him for his work. It was a, an additional donation. Uh, okay, okay. okay. It's getting out of hand here. No, no, Let's stop. No, no, no. He spoke twice. No, no. He spoke twice. no come on. Yeah, yeah, but he spoke twice, and I would like. I know that, but you spoke twice as long. <laughs> well, no. I think what's going to happen is you're going to spend another four years and another quarter million. But I would like to answer Mosher. Go ahead. Oh, fast. Okay. Before, He's gone, so don't bother. Before I ever <laughs> brought it up to the library board, I called Mike. I called Mike Termini on the phone, and I, I told him what I knew. And he told me that he had talked with John Barasoni, the, the attorney, a year before, and that John Barasoni told him the, at the time, he was only in for 11000 And at that time, Barasoni told him, 
the worst that's going to happen is you'll have to pay back $11,000. That was, and Termini told me this. This is what he got from the attorney. So, so the attorney breached his duty to the board, kind of like your, this attorney breached his duty to the board, by not informing them. Hey, there's a library board member doing business with the library. He didn't tell them that. But it was eleven thousand, and then a year later it was thirty thousand. So it was he was doing first, business first. with the library. Okay, first. Thank you. Thank you both for your comments. Okay. Uh, next agenda item. Are we done, or, or can I ask one more question? Oh, who are you asking the question of? Of the attorney. Of who? Of the district attorney. Of Gina. Oh, okay, Gina. You probably won't be able to answer this, but I know this is a question that's on a lot of ratepayers' minds, and that is, how much longer is this? How much longer is this going to go on? How much more are we going to have to pay? And is there any way of shortcutting or, or reducing that in any way? I wish I had answers to all those questions. To the extent I can try to work on those issues, it will have to be a closed session. Yeah. But you understand the, the, yes. the concern? Yes. I think she'd have to be F. Lee Bailey or something like that. Okay. Can we move on? Minutes from the Board of Directors meeting November 15, 2018. Point of, point of uh, consent. This is a consent. Consent oh, it is consent, so we don't have to do anything. Well, right? Vote. We vote on the consent agenda. We don't actually. You don't actually? It's just. Okay. All right. Okay, so then we're going to go to district reports, right? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, <coughs> Administration and engineering, are there any reports? Are there any department like James? You're a department, uh, right? You have the uh, department status reports in front of you okay. administration, finance, environmental, operations, and legal. So, uh, the full management yeah. team is here. Uh, uh, well, I totally to lost my place in my mind. <laughs> They'd be more than happy to answer any questions from any reports they need for that. So, administration and engineering, is there something you can answer for me? Do you have a question? Uh, um, I have to look and see if I highlighted it. Um, oh, yeah, no, I didn't highlight anything on that. Because yeah. I had already talked to you. So if you want to talk about this or James. No? Yes? One, one quick question. What? One quick question. Where is the question? For James. If I cannot. Sorry, one quick question for James? Yeah. You can ask James a quick question. James, on the inflows and outflows where water is going between systems um, yes. on your report? Yes. Um, there was 129,000. By the way, what are the units on that report? Is it gallons or That's gallons? Where is that 129,000 going? It was, it was sort of been a. It was going to felt for the time being of a fall tree um, diversion being down due to a surge protector. Okay, gotcha. And so we had to supplement felt to the felt system with water from the north system. And then the north system is also shipping most of the water to Long Peak, it looked like. All the water. All water. Okay. Is that going through any other system or is that direct? This is what no, I'm it's direct. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other comments to James? Okay. Next item is finance. Put Stephanie up. I've got questions on the bill pay. Chair Henry, just because this is the first time we're going through this, I just want to point out that this is all grouped under one, when you say a different item, that, that works, but it's all grouped under one agenda item. So for purposes of Brown Act and so on, it's one item, but I understand you know, stepping through it one part of the time. Okay. It's just sort of clarification. Okay. 
So I, I think on the bill pay, some of these that you probably won't answer, some... What's the matter? Continuing. There's continuing litigation in the park. Okay. So I, I think this might be uh, a, a question for Ben about the um, Olympia Patrol Service. There's a bill in here for $650. Is that a monthly bill? Is that? Yes, it's monthly. And, and what exactly do they do? They, they, in the past, the Olympia watershed has had problems with a lot of motorcycle and off-road vehicle trespass outside of the trail areas. And it, it causes a lot of destruction to the environment there. It's a, it's a sensitive habitat area. And so we hired the land trust a number of years ago to go and patrol the area and send us a report of illegal uses that are happening on the property. And so that's what that $600 is for. So do you uh, look at that on a regular basis to see if that's money that's being spent wisely or? Yeah, we're always keeping track of the reports and if there's cusp wires and fences and access going in and we go out and fix the fences and we maintain um, if there's safety or hazard areas where a tree falls down or a tree's partially fallen down and it might cause some kind of risk for users on the property, it is open to the public and so okay. there is public access there so we, we use those reports. We don't have enough staff time to go out there and be monitoring now and regular basis ourselves, so we have them to do that. It's quite cost effective. Thank you. I, I don't mean to uh, totally uh, hog this item, if you guys want to say something, but um, I, I'm looking at some of these uh, stream flows uh, they really add up. There's about three different bills. Oh. And I realize we need to do stream flow. I guess I'm always at, my question is, are, are we putting RFPs out for some of this stuff, or are we just saying, hey, uh, with the stream flow and temperature study that we've been doing, we've been conducting a stream flow and temperature monitoring program for the last four years on uh -huh. the San Lorenzo River um, in, with regard to our surface water diversions and how they impact total flow on the San Lorenzo River and temperature on the San Lorenzo River, which is a critical aspect of stream health for fish, for fish, for fish health, for fish success. Mostly salmon. And um, so I think there, I'm hoping that that will, when we have these workshops that we've been talking about tonight, that that will be one of the key um, aspects that we'll be discussing. What we've learned from that monitoring program and how that informs the next phase of what our program is moving towards is more conductive use and making sure that we're enhancing stream flow and, and making sure fish habitat is is taken care of while we um, sustainably manage our water supply in the groundwater areas. Okay, thank you. Um, so Stephanie, uh, this LAIF, Local Agency Investment Fund, can you tell us about that? Yeah, on the cash, the cash section. So uh, lake is a common area that a lot of government agencies will uh, in, invest their money in, in their pool. Um, the district used to have a lot more money of uh, the money sitting in Lake. Uh, and then a couple years ago, the Santa Cruz County Fund, similarly operated, uh, was generating better returns. And so we started to, to keep more of our money with the county. Um, there's pros and cons to each outside of just the, the interest that it earns uh, alone. Currently though, LEAF has started to now outcrawl Santa Cruz County Fund 
And so this uh, past month in November, we actually transferred $500,000 into the late fund to start to gain some of the better interest there. Um, late only allows you to hold one account with them. So there's no possibilities of being able to have sub accounts for different things. Um, for example, we did just recently close on the $2 million probation tank loan. One of the lender's requirements was that the money that they sent sit in its own separate fund. So that money we had wired to the county and the county created a sub fund for us to be able to hold that $2 million um, separately as we draw down to make payments. So the count, I mean, each of them have um, some flexibilities, uh, but right now, since there is what I deem a more significant increase in the interest rates um, for late, we, did, we are gonna start to migrate some of our monies over there. Okay, thank you. I didn't mean to hog this, um, <laughs> so. Does anybody else have, like, if there's there's more finance in here, more bills, um, there's environmental, there's operations, and legal. Yes, you want to say something? So on the environmental report, um, I wasn't exactly sure what, um, what the context was. It looked like there was a mix in the report of potentially historical things and current things. So, for, and, I, and I was a little confused. So, so for example, under claimant adaptation, there's an inventory of 2017 report is providing the additional items of October 18th board agenda. So I wasn't sure if the report is talking about what you've done or what's happening currently, or whether it's a full historical retrospective up to current. Oh, it's, it's mostly current. Mostly all the things that we are working on currently. So with climate adaptation, there's um, there's several efforts that we're working toward, and um, writing a climate action plan is part of that, and doing an inventory. And we recently uh, received the report from just a couple like a month ago. We received the, the report from a verification third party verification on our uh, inventory. So that that is um, discussed. Okay, and so on public outreach, there's interviews, Rick Rogers interview airing several times, two weeks in mid-October. I'm trying to just make sure when I'm reading this is, am I reading this from the point of view of everything that's happened up to this point over some period of time? Or is it specifically about last month or last quarter or last well, week? Some things are ongoing. Right, and so that one looks like something I must have missed. I didn't pull it out, but um, usually I have uh, I have the most current efforts that are going on with regard to that. We haven't done another interview with KCZ since that one, so I didn't remove it. Okay. But if we were to do another one, and I expect we will, because we have a contract with them, um, I'll put the next, the most recent one in there. And who's responsible for all our Facebook and social media postings? On who, who in staff handles that? I do that. We do that. Okay, thank you. Any any other questions? Oh, uh, Tony, you have a question? I do actually. I have a question for Shannon. I'm sorry that I, I don't understand this. I just want to try to understand when you were talking about those. Um, the studies that for the care of the fish and everything, and you know, I think here in San Lorenzo Valley, we really care about the environment. I just want to understand: is that it, paying for those kind of studies? Is that something that all water districts do? Do they all? It's, I would think that would be like the responsibility of the state or something. Is that? Is it normal that it that well, it would not be? all water districts get water from surface water, okay. and so um, not all water districts have an environmental department. Mm -hmm. And this water district gets about fifty percent of their water supply from surface water, and that does have impact on endangered species. We are in a biodiverse area where we have a lot of species that are impacted by human activities more so than other areas where they're less um, biodiverse region, so. So, and if, if I can, does that mean that we want to ensure that we're not going to be 
over using the water and not going to be endangering them. So therefore, then the state or whoever, the federal government, won't come after us and, and tell us, okay, you have to stop using that water. So this is kind of a, a way to prevent that from happening. Yeah, and it's been just, effective. Okay. The, the city of Santa Cruz has been in this for 10 years mm -hmm. to the same extent of what we're doing now with the okay. stream of pump on there. I just want to make sure that we, the, the rate payers, um, you know, that it's appropriate that we should be paying for that. Yeah, the city of Santa Cruz does have a, a much more robust environmental department than we do. Mm -hmm. you know, many people on staff, hydrologists, and I doubt that their environmental compliance department is got four people or five people, their water conservation department has four or five people, mm -hmm. they have a public relations department, they have, you know, they do all those things. Mm -hmm. and, so. and they're way bigger than us. Yeah. And they're, way, they're a much yeah. larger customer base, but they also get their water from a similar situation. Okay, well thank you very much, I appreciate it. Lou, you had your hand up? Yeah, question for uh, Director Bruce. Do you see any benefit in integrating some of the things that we learned on Monday at the symposium into the environmental thing? Absolutely. Thank you. We were sort of like channeling each other. I was waiting for the uh, director's reports and director's communications to point out the, the thing that we got to enjoy on, on Monday, but absolutely, and that's why Jen and Carly were both in attendance. <clears throat> and there's, um, I think, a great, great oh, opportunity. I didn't, I didn't see Jen. Where were you? She was there. I saw her. Oh. I was in the front row. I said, Missed that, sorry. Short answer, yes. Yeah. But I mean, particularly the, the precipitation studies would, are of great interest to us. Right, yeah, right. Uh, Lydia? Um, on the financial side of it, you said it was $650 a month to invest in a valuable resource. Mm -hmm. I'm well spent. Does, it have a, does whoever's doing it, are they armed? Do they have a story? Not it's a enforcement type of thing. It's just a monitoring. monitoring. So if they see something, they will enforcement. And they let us know. Yeah, Money well spent. Um, Mark, you want to say something? Yeah, two questions. Uh, Lastly, from Bella, one is addressed to Stephanie. Very nice. Two questions to Jen. Uh, regarding their, before uh, the previous uh, general manager vacated his position, and uh, went on to uh, greener pastures. There was a discussion of a pending loan application to pay for <laughs> capital facilities. And I would like to know what the, the amount was and what was what's the status of that loan for it. It was a bridge loan that... Uh, None of that's happened yet. So that's still the USDA loan. Yeah. And so we still haven't, that's still in the submittal phase. We still haven't even gotten official word back from and what was the total amount uh, estimated? Gosh. Eight million? Eight, 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 eight yeah. point three. It started off like six five, but no, it's like eight point three. 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 So we're hoping to hear back from them. I was on the phone with them today. They're hoping to get us answers back by 1231. Okay. That's coming up pretty soon. Okay. So I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the second question is, uh, in, in, we're, it seems like we're entering into a regional sharing water agreement and relationship through SMEGWA. <coughs> Conjunctive use. Conjunctive use, uh, essentially benefiting uh, mostly Scotts Valley at this point. I'm hoping that the future board will be, uh, through their membership, will be involved in how that sharing of water through conjunctive use will affect our current demand here within the valley in terms of its rate payers and the cost, <coughs> cost the potential cost changes or cost increases that affect rates. I, I want to keep that on our radar. Okay. Thank you. And anybody else uh, have uh, questions in this in these uh, department status reports like operations? James would love to answer questions. <laughs> Good James answer. <laughs> okay. So I guess we kind of skipped right to committee reports, right, Margaret? 
We, we can if there, there haven't been very many committee meetings, so just engineering and Ledox, so. Yeah. So you don't have anything to say? I'm not on either of those committees, so no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true, you're not, although you're soon going to be right? on engineering. But I'm not psychic. <laughs> really? I would have thought by now you would have learned how. Don't know what we, we will, would have said. <laughs> okay. All right, director's reports, director's communications. Have you got a communication? Uh, <clears throat> Lou kind of did the uh, preview of, of whatever I was going to say on Monday. I okay. was uh, able to play hostess to the uh, California's fourth climate change adaptation assessment. And there was a dual location presentation, San Luis Obispo, and UC Santa Cruz. It was attended by about 60 people. We had a series of speakers who were uh, presenting research and findings about the status of climate change impacts to California's central coast. And the, uh, the attendees were able to hear, as, as we pointed out, studies that indicated variability in temperature, variability in precipitation, sea level rise impacts, and it's consequential impacts to saltwater intrusion into aquifers and cliff erosion and estuary and imp impacts. For us here, it's more likely that we're going to have impacts in precipitation changes, a lot more and a lot less, and because of higher temperatures and, and higher evapotranspiration and ever-increasing risk of fire. So that's something that I'm sure Jen and Carly also took away from the event and are going to be integrating into the work of the Environmental Committee and right. all of our associated watershed management and planning. Yeah, I've, I've, back in the day, when I was on another water board, and it used to be the Santa Margarita Basin, I remember people from UCSC coming out and talking about all the, you know, we're going to get more rain, we're going to get more droughts, the rain's going to be worse, the droughts are going to be worse, and Pretty scary stuff. So, any anybody else on um, director communications? We haven't been directors too long to communicate, but I think I've been talking a lot anyway. Ed once paid me. Ed once paid me a dollar to be quiet for one hour. So if I get too bad, maybe somebody will offer to pay me. Oh, Bill. Oh, yeah. I your engineering, but you we, did the meeting we, we was didn't have, We did have a meeting. We went over the basic stuff, but um, I did uh, got interested in asset management and computer modeling, etc. And that was what I was talking about. I didn't really know some of the yeah. stuff that we already have, but I did reach out to uh, an expert in the field, and he's a guy that I used to work for uh, for San Jose Water, okay. and I, I set up a meeting in. Uh, uh, Rick and uh, some of the staff are going to go there on Wednesday, and he's just going to give like an hour, an hour and a half long um, speech. And I'm sure that it'll be, it should be helpful, you know, to, um, to hear from an expert on on that. And then, you know, possibly we can bring uh, discuss that more at future engineering committee meetings. All right. So. Board of Directors meeting agenda items. There's a list here. Um, and I, I would like to uh, see Santa Margarita listed in this group because there's been all those meetings every month, but I never heard anybody come back from the meeting and really say much of anything of what was going on. I do know from talking to the facilitator, starting in January, there are going to be public meetings on Saturdays um, in various locations. Yep. Scotts Valley, San Lorenzo. What? Sorry, so they'll all be at the Felton Community Hall. All and of them? All of them, and then will be the second Saturday of the month. They've been scheduled. And it went out um, this week. 
Oh, I, and go, so I we, didn't. We did do a notice. And I so didn't get a notice. There will be other venues. Will, it will be in the paper and things like that will be coming up. But we just did the social media blast this week. It will be the second Saturday of the month, January, February, and March. Right. The second Saturday of the month. I believe the first one is on January 12th. It will be on land use and water supply. And, um, and it will be at the Felton Town Hall. It begins at 9. So even Scotts Valley is going to come over to Felton? Everyone should be coming to Felton. We're only doing them in one place. Okay. We'll get the notice of sign Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get you. You know, it just went out. Like, the, 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 okay. So it wasn't the parking is so terrible, and the sound is so bad from the traffic. I don't know why they didn't try Zion. Anyway. So I'd like that at least to be on the agendas so that those of us who are on that committee can come back and, and give a report so people know what's going on. Because I think that's an issue, that people really don't know what's going on. And so uh, they can get a lot of wild ideas. Or maybe they'll get the right idea. <laughs> this list is just a partial list, and now that there's a chair, a chair uh, we'll sit down and we'll start developing a schedule with these lists and get more input. Because there's a, there's a bunch of other things that, you know, on the website, and there's different things that staff is, yeah. is ready to move ahead on. But the plan is to, to bring the stuff dark and get the stuff in front of you. I know there's a lot of these issues. I was just specially concerned about right. Santa Monica. Right, and we'll, uh, we need to update the strategic plan sooner than later, because and, and that's where a lot of this will fall in. And then we'll get on a schedule, and so staff can prepare the necessary backup reports and so forth to get a schedule, so okay. we're not kind of chasing our tail trying to get too much done at once, and, and we've got to, you know, work out. Great. Workshops. Workshops, exactly. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Uh, does this mean we're about done here? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. well, well, done, done so we can go, session. we can adjourn to closed session? Mm -hmm. Additions to the agenda of the public comment on the closed session. Right. Right. Uh, okay, public comment for closed session. Mark? Yes, Mark, thank you. I think we should shut down this litigation as quickly as possible and uh, join uh, uh, Mr. Holloway's suit against the other adversary. Let's stop wasting our money. This has been going on long enough. Uh, let's go to the court and vacate that case if we can. The case of not defending uh, Terry Vieira and the blogger. Okay, uh, that's all I have to say. That would be great if we could do it. I think we ought to hire Bruce to go sue somebody for us. <laughs> yeah. You know, I could sue this district so many times. And, uh, we'll sue I, a different district. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, every time you back and forth, there's going to be more than I'm going to tell you. Um, there was a Brown Act violation that this district was doing that I did not want this district to have to pay to defend. So I sued Santa Clara County. Santa Clara County, they're ten times bigger than Santa Cruz County. They're a thousand times bigger than this district, Santa Clara County. I sued them to make the same point. So I didn't hurt them much, but I made my point. I won that case. Um, so I could have sued this district many times, and the only reason I picked this, this particular case was because this is a way to get private people to pay the district, to get money into the district from outsiders that broke the law. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not where you just hit up the district and go sue the district for being a bad actor and then they have to pay your attorney and then they, they pay your attorney and all. All you do is, that's a sting. That's a sting, that's no fun. Um, so I thought this would be a little bit better to try to get some of the bad actors to pay the district. So we got about four different cases here. You got me versus Showcase. You got Vieira versus the district. Vieira versus Hines. And district versus Hines. Okay, out of these four cases, I think I got the best one. 
because all I have to prove is financial interest in a contract. And he admitted it. He admitted it in a board meeting. He admitted it in a deposition. And he admitted it at trial. So it's well established that he has a financial interest. So my, that's all I have to prove. And that's easy. Now, the Arizona district, I, I guess I, I really, I mean, this to me, this is a terrible thing. He's the one that everybody should be focused on. He's the one trying to get money out of the district. I'm trying to get money into the district, and he's trying to take money out. The other two, suing the attorney, how often does that work? I mean, you read the paper, right? How often do people sue their attorneys, and it actually works? So, and, and I think the district has a much better case than Vieira, because at least the district paid for the attorney that didn't represent them well. Uh, but Vieira got free legal defense, and accepted it, and uh, anyway, of these four cases, I think mine's the easiest to prove. So I, I'm frustrated. I don't know why it takes four years to do these things, or, or, or eight, or whatever it's going to be. Okay. So any other public comment on closed session? Recess, okay. We're having a recess. Ten minutes. And it's not to play.